She had her gun in the other room, and she couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't alone. In a rush, she doused her head with water and cleared her eyes to a blur. She had to do something now. Not wanting to waste time rinsing off, she turned off the shower and let the soap creep down her skin. It felt like an unwanted touch, spiraling chills over her body. Squinting back the sting from her eyes, she pulled at the sliding door and fortified herself for a fight. Her cop instincts kicked in, but the steam in her small bathroom had parted like the Red Sea. To her shock, the bathroom door gaped open. Oh God, she wasn't alone. Chapter Eight. An eerie silence mocked her. Maybe she'd imagined the whole thing. Her house was stone still now. Even its usual creaks and groans were mute. Raven strained to hear anything out of the ordinary. Then the familiar sound of a simmering pot of spaghetti sauce on her stove reminded her. What time was it? For her, time ground to a halt. She found herself praying that Christian would forego his usual promptness to be early for a change. Alert to anything, she caught a motion at the corner of her eye. Her jaw dropped at the sight, sucking steamy air down her windpipe. A bloodless pallor, her own reflection stared back through streaks on the mirror. The bastard had left her a message: "You aren't safe anywhere." Mickey learned the hard way. Printed on the fogged glass, his warning ridiculed her. Mickey's killer was in her home, unimpressed with her authority. Naked as she was, she conceded his point, but she couldn't allow herself to be distracted now. Easing out of the tub, Raven kept her eyes focused on the open door. Every muscle tensed. She waited for a faceless attacker to make his move, prepared for the intruder to rush her while she'd be most vulnerable. Step. By step, she inched toward the door. Fear massed into staunch self-preservation. Holding her breath, she listened. But in the pit of her stomach, reality gripped her. A killer stalked her, violating her home. She wasn't safe, not any more. Raven reached for the robe hanging on the bathroom door. Her hair was soaked, strands stiffened from lingering soap suds. Water dripped off her body. Making the floor slippery, throwing the garment around her shoulders, she didn't take the time to dry off. Adrenaline coursed through her veins. She felt the chill in the air seep through the pores of her dank skin. If she was attacked here, in her condition, only her training and mental toughness would keep her alive. Her mind focused on the location of her weapon, willing it to her hand. She prayed her intruder wasn't armed, or an even worse case scenario. That the coward might use her own weapon against her. With her back to the wall, she crept through the house, dodging floorboards that would give her away. Her eyes darted down the length of the hall as she made her way to the bedroom, and her Glock nine millimeter. A faint sound somewhere deeper within the house forced her to stop where she stood. Sweeping past her, a draft of cold air made her teeth chatter, her body betraying the pretense of courage. Why was it so cold? Peering over her shoulder, she used the mirror on her bedroom dresser to improve her chances. No one was behind the door, and with her closet open, just as she'd left it, it would be impossible for someone to hide in her small room. Quickly, she stepped toward her nightstand and inched open the top drawer, not taking her eye off the doorway. Letting out a sigh of relief, she found her Glock still in its holster. Releasing the safety, she gripped the weapon, its heft stealing her for a confrontation. Now the odds were even. Time to hunt in earnest. Junior, you better be brushing your teeth. I'm coming up for an inspection. Yolanda Rodriguez raised her voice, calling upstairs. Even with her precocious child out of sight, she knew little Tony would still be playing his Game Boy. The ten-year-old had their nightly ritual down to a science. Her warning part of the routine. By the time she got mid-stair, he'd shoot to the bathroom and conjure up a mouthful of froth for her benefit, practically rubbing the enamel off his teeth. 
It didn't matter that his little feet sounded like a herd of wild animals dashing down the upstairs hallway. A glint of satisfaction would shine in his dark eyes, like he'd fooled her once again. In those moments, he looked so much like his father. That glint reminded her. Little Tony had been conceived on a night when she saw that exact look in her husband's eyes. Shaking her head, she continued her chore as a smile fought to break free. Wiping down the kitchen counter, she made the room sparkle, a far cry from the condition it had been earlier. Make your own chalupa night was a Thursday dinner ritual in the Rodriguez household, and as far as she knew, the first peanut butter and pineapple chalupa had been invented tonight under her very roof. Celia, time for bed, Miha. Even though her daughter slouched in one of the living room chairs watching a muted television, she still had to raise her voice to get above the music blasting on the young girl's headset. She supposed that flipping through TV channels fast enough produced some semblance of an MTV video. Not having cable, it was Celia's only option. According to her daughter, she was the only one in school not allowed to watch MTV. A social disaster. But mom, dad is still not home. Can't we wait up for him? She couldn't see Celia's face, but she pictured her brow furrowed with eyes rolled toward the ceiling, accompanied by a heavy sigh. Her twelve-year-old daughter was an admitted drama queen who still had a crush on her father. Yolanda understood completely. Even after two years of courtship and fourteen years of marriage, she still carried a torch for her husband. Dad's still not home. So what else is new? Yolanda muttered under her breath as she wiped her hands on a dish towel. Raising her voice once again, she answered, "No, honey, you've got school tomorrow. Your father will understand." Walking over to her daughter, she gently raised the headphones from her ears, then cradled Celia's warm cheeks in her hands. Lowering her lips to the young girl's forehead, she kissed her, saying, "Time for bed, Cosafina." Leaning back, Celia turned and smiled. Between them, the nickname of "fine thing" in Spanish was just as good as saying, "Love you too, mom." Turning off the TV by remote, Celia walked toward the stairs. With a devilish grin, she turned and pointed upstairs, silently gesturing for Yolanda's cooperation. It took her only a moment to understand what her daughter wanted. "You better be done with your teeth, Junior." She called her final warning upstairs. With a silent chuckle, Celia raised the OK sign and stepped loudly up the flight of steps. A second later, a rumble down the hallway and running water in the sink told them both that Tony Jr. was up to his old tricks. But tonight, she and her daughter had won the game. The twinkle would be in Celia's beautiful eyes. Kids would be kids, she mused with a shake of her head. But then, what was her excuse? Before she followed her daughter upstairs, she did her routine walk through the house. She'd lock the doors and turn off the lights with one last check of the thermostat. The laughter of her children kept a smile on her face. As usual, she left the front porch light on and a lamp near the front door so Tony would know he was loved and missed. But as she dimmed the light in the living room, a motion caught her attention. She'd seen something through the drapery shears. Yolanda pulled aside the front window curtain and squinted into the night, blocking the dim lighting behind her with cupped hands to shield her eyes. Again, to the left, near the street, a shadow darted for cover in the hedges of their property. Their property, she gasped. Backlit by a street lamp, the movement had been abrupt. On many occasions, the neighbor's cat yowled in the night, an eerie cry. Or the animal rooted around in the garbage, dropping a trash can lid to the ground from time to time. Her heart leapt every time. Over the years, she realized her mind sometimes played tricks whenever Tony wasn't home. Her first reaction was to chastise herself for being foolish, but tonight was different. Quickly making the sign of the cross, she closed her eyes and prayed she'd been mistaken. But her only answer was the ugly truth: a red laser pierced the night and cut through the blackness like a knife. 
A hideous cyclops with a bloody red eye glared directly at her, finding her peeking through the window. Damn it all, this was no cat. Racing to the phone near the kitchen counter, she grabbed the receiver to her ear. With trembling fingers, she punched the buttons, dialing 911. All she heard was her quickening breaths. She tried again. Nothing. No dial tone. The phone was dead. Her hand tightened on her gun as Raven stepped through her house. With every room she entered, her arms rigidly extended in a two-fisted grip, aiming the weapon into every corner in search of the intruder. Between rooms, she held her glock with bent elbows as she made her way to the next room. She left the kitchen for last. A glimpse down the hallway revealed the source of the cold air. In the kitchen, the side door off her carport was flung open. Still, it could be a trap. The man might be clever enough to open the door, hoping she'd let her guard down. And the outside light was out, no doubt disabled on purpose. As she entered the room, her eyes peered anywhere someone might hide. So far, she was alone. But more evidence of the intruder was plain to see. Her stovetop had been wrecked, spotted with sauce as if the pot had boiled over. Yet it was obvious what had happened— the man had made a contribution to her recipe. A framed photo of her father in uniform poked out from the bubbling sauce. It had been ripped from the wall and thrown into the sauce pot, splattering a mess across her white stove. Maybe it had only been a diversion. Stay alert, Mackenzie. Raven shifted her gaze to the open doorway. She aimed her weapon into the void. For all she knew, the man stood just outside in the shadows— she wouldn't be able to see his silhouette. "'You better be long gone, you son of a bitch!' Her voice was stern, so contrary to how she felt. She slid out the door into the night. On the cement of the carport, her damp feet ached with the cold. In an instant, winter's chill seized her. She gasped, sucking icy air down her throat. Then a vapor steam billowed from her lungs. "'Keep moving!' In the distance, she heard a droning sound from a television, her neighbor's house. The sights and sounds of her childhood suburb filled her senses. Even after someone had broken into her home, the rest of the world went on in blissful ignorance. Damn it. Slowly, she let her guard down. But just as she lowered her gun, a noise came from the front of her house. Her body tensed again. The sound had been faint. A scuff of a shoe? Racing around the corner, she brushed past an evergreen. Bounding up the step, she reeled her shoulders, trying to aim her gun. But her arms struck something immovable, the dark shape of a man. A loud pop, shattered glass. Cold as she was, pain shot through her joints when the man grabbed her in a vice-like grip. He pulled her off the ground. She felt his warm breath against her neck. With elbows pinned to her chest, all she could do was flail her legs, kicking at her attacker. She shrieked, not from fright, but from anger and frustration. A low, guttural sound. Writhing and twisting, she felt blood rush to her face. Her heels jabbed at the man's legs, striking without mercy. If she hurt him badly enough, he'd drop her. Only a matter of time before she found the sweet spot. With his grunt, she ramped up her assault. Damn it! Let me go, you bastard! The man had his hand on the barrel of her gun, trying to wrench it free. Hey, hey, stop it! Ow! he protested. Is this how you greet all your guests? Raven stopped. Oh, my God! She knew that voice. The man's hand pried the weapon from her grasp only after she let him win. Christian? I, I thought... She didn't bother to finish. Her heartbeat still hammered her eardrums. He loosened his grip and stepped aside, setting her near the step to the front porch. Be careful. I dropped the wine bottle. Glass is everywhere. Looking down at the robe and her feet, he asked, Are you barefoot? Ignoring his question, she turned toward him. Someone broke into my house. A fleeting and cynical notion took hold, her cop instincts hard to deny. 
What if Christian had been the one in her house, then conveniently pretended to have just arrived? Her brow furrowed as she gave the idea shape, staring at him in the dark. Yet even with his face in shadow, she heard the concern in his voice. Are you okay? He didn't hurt you, did he? After brushing back her damp hair, he reached for her shoulders. You're wet. You must be freezing. God, how she wanted to believe in Christian. Being right about him meant her trust barometer was fully functional. But even now, she heard Tony's voice in her head, reminding her how dangerous this man was. Raven loved being a cop, but at times she hated how it had changed her over the years. Had she grown so jaded that she couldn't trust her own heart? Before she delved deeper into that thought, he handed her the gun, then scooped her up in his arms, lifting her without effort. Stepping around the corner, he carried her through the kitchen door and slammed it shut with an elbow. With all his fussing, she felt ridiculous. But as she relaxed into his shoulder, smelling his subtle cologne mixed with the leather of his jacket, everything felt right. She'd been on her own for so long, it felt good to be taken care of for a change. Bedroom? he asked. Still stunned by his bold gesture, all she could do was point down the hall, eyes wide. Then her damned cop brain took charge. Christian, please, I'm fine. You don't have to— Before she finished her objection, he'd yanked back the covers of her bed and set her down. She began to thaw the instant he pulled the quilt to her chin, more a reaction to him than the fine insulating capabilities of her comforter. But as he stared down at her, his confident expression melted like the chill from her skin. Suddenly realizing where he was, he stood abruptly, then shoved his hands into his jeans pockets. Christian's sudden uneasiness surprised her. She fought back a smile. Before now, Cute was not a word she would have ever associated with Christian Delacourt. But damn if he didn't have the word stamped across his forehead. In blaze orange, he made her feel safe again. It felt good not to be alone. And by the way he avoided her gaze, she knew he felt awkward with the unexpected intimacy. So you're human after all, Delacourt. I'm going to look through the rest of the house, if you don't mind— Make sure we are alone. He narrowed his eyes. Can I make you some hot tea or something? Please. The teapot is on the stove, she called down the hall after he'd slipped out. The cop in her added, And be careful what you touch. I'm going to call for a team to dust for prints. Raven couldn't just sit like some grand queen bee. Sliding from bed, she tightened her robe around her waist and gave the sash a tug. She picked up the phone from her nightstand and called the station house. A long shot, but maybe the bastard had left some fingerprints. Raven ended the call, knowing a team would be arriving soon. She had to get dressed. I'm just going to rinse off, get the soap out of my hair. She called to him. The idea of a cold water rinse gave her a shiver, but the message on the mirror had to be preserved. More steam would cover it up. Maybe a blast of ice water to her scalp would jumpstart her brain. Stepping back into the bath, she found Christian staring at her mirror, his jaw tense. He'd started his search of her house where the whole thing began. So this wasn't a random break-in. The bastard killed Mickey. He stared at Raven, trying to make a point. And he tossed a photograph into your dinner plans. Any connection? The man in the photo was a cop in uniform. You're observant. A photograph of my father. She crossed her arms, amazed how he'd noticed so much in his short walk through the kitchen. A wet strand of hair fell across her face. With a finger, she tucked it behind an ear. If this wealthy bachelor gig doesn't work out, maybe I can find an opening for you in law enforcement. Not exactly my thing, but thanks. With his green eyes fixed on her, he pressed, Now answer my question. Not sure I can. Just give me use of my bathroom and fix me that hot tea you promised. It'll give me time to think. She led him by the arm and switched places in the cramped quarters. 
Christian's stoic expression returned, as if she'd just given him the brush off. But to his credit, he didn't interrogate her any longer. He turned toward the kitchen. A tinge of guilt gnawed at her for what she'd thought about his intentions. Before he was out of eyesight, she called to him, peeking around the bathroom door. Christian? He looked over his shoulder, the concern for her safety still in his eyes. God, she hoped she wasn't imagining it. Thanks. For everything. I'm glad you're here. And she meant every word. A faint light from her bedroom painted his handsome face with warmth. His expression softened. A lazy curve to his lips broadened into a seductive grin. And time stopped. Oh, that smile! Downright lethal. His eyes locked on to hers in knowing silence. Suddenly she became aware just how naked she was beneath her robe. She clutched the collar of her garment and inched farther behind the door. Her cheeks flushed with need. Maybe he wouldn't notice. In an awkward gesture, she cleared her throat to ward off the emotion. He seemed to read her mind. Without a word, his smile faded, and he quietly resumed his trek down the hall. Just like that, the moment came and went between them. Slowly, she closed the door behind her, struggling with a grin of her own. His smile, just like she remembered. Damn it. She wanted to be right about him. Hauling into his driveway, Tony knew Yoli would not be pleased with his late hour. He'd missed dinner and tucking the kids in bed. Admittedly, Celia and Junior would be mortified if their friends knew they were still getting tucked in for the night, but this was a family ritual that Tony wanted to keep sacred for as long as possible. A parent didn't get these years back. As usual, his front porch light was on, as well as the living room lamp. Yoli always told him it represented her burning love for him. He liked that idea very much. His shoulders ached with tension from the long day, but the warm welcome home lifted his spirits. Parking the vehicle in the drive near the front of their house, he turned off the ignition and flung open the car door. The Latino radio station abruptly came to an end. Stepping out of the car, he fumbled with his key ring, looking for the one for the front door. Slipping from his grip, the keys hit the ground with a clink. His eyes followed the sound, then he stooped to pick them up. In that instant, a shadow eclipsed the street light, casting its length along the driveway. He looked up, half expecting his Yoli to be standing there, something she did on occasion. But a darkened silhouette stood before him. A man. He narrowed his eyes, ready to speak when a muffled scream jolted his attention. Looking over his shoulder toward a second-story window, Yoli pounded the glass, her face distorted in terror. Run! They have guns! Run! She cried. In his mind, the scene slowed as if he were mired in quicksand. Part of his brain knew it was already over. Too late. He reached for his service revolver, pulling it from his shoulder holster, instinctively releasing the safety. The stranger didn't flinch. Calmly and without a word, the man raised his hand, then slowly pointed a finger. A signal. A series of red lasers launched from the trees and hedges across the front of his house. A deadly light show. Five. There were five others. He was sorely outnumbered. What the hell? It was all Tony got out. Thud. Searing pain tore through his left shoulder, spinning him to the ground. As he fell, a ricochet sparked off the sidewalk. The bullet pierced his chest. Oh, God, this was bad. Yolanda shrieked. No! Tony, no! Suddenly, the side of his house erupted. Bullets came from all directions. Rounds shattered his front window and ripped apart the brick on impact. Careful with his aim, he fired two rounds, then rolled for cover behind a brick planter. Shards of stone nicked his face and hands. The man who'd given the order was long gone, becoming a part of the deepening shadows. 
he'd lost his best target. Silenced gunfire? The precision of the attack, the hand signals, the stealth, it all pointed to one thing. Mercenaries. What the hell was happening? The front of his shirt grew wet and sticky, and he knew the tang of blood when he smelled it. He had to remain calm, for now the shooting had stopped, but he still felt them out there, waiting for him to make a mistake. Keeping his head down, he shoved nearer his porch, his chest on fire. None of this made sense, but it didn't matter. Now he had only one thing on his mind, to protect his family. Ever the pragmatist, with his cop instincts, he envisioned the worst. He pictured himself pinned down while others broke into his home from the rear. The imagined screams of his children overloaded his head like an insidious migraine. Only one thing left for him to do. Reaching into his pocket, he found his cell phone and dialed 911. He recognized the dispatcher's voice. After giving his address, he added, Officer down. I repeat, officer down. Proceed. Code three. He wanted sirens, loud, lights flashing. ETA five minutes. Tony, are you okay? The female dispatcher broke protocol. No, sir, I'm not. Just take care of my family, okay? He ended the call. Tony still heard Yolanda crying upstairs. He blocked out her agony, flashing on memories of his beautiful wife holding their first-born child, Celia, in her arms, a tiny pink bundle. Tears filled his eyes. He was powerless to help her and the kids now. Their safety would be in the hands of others. And God. He tasted blood in his mouth. The chest wound was nasty. A numbing sensation inched across his body. Before long, he'd lose consciousness. Picking a target, he carefully squeezed off another shot, and was rewarded by a grunt. Maybe that would give them something else to think about. The howling dogs in the neighborhood nearly masked the sound. Tony had never been so thankful for all the mangy mutts in his hood. The more noise, the better. His breaths came in short wheezes now. He was losing his fight. Choking up blood, he wiped his mouth with his sleeve. Please, God, hold my family safe in your arms, he whispered his prayer. Slowly, he slumped with his back to a brick wall, so near the front door of his home. The numbing cold began to claim him. Streetlights blurred, warping into a series of shimmering rings around the bright globes. In the distance, sirens teased his ears, becoming louder as the night was set on fire. Flashing beacons of red and blue circled the night sky, streaking their message. The cavalry had arrived. Code three. He wanted to smile, but couldn't muster the strength. His jaw went slack. He struggled for every breath. Tilting his head back, he turned his eyes toward the heavens. Beyond the lights, the stars dotted the sky and shimmered, until one by one they melted into inky black. He focused on the last star, but eventually his eyelids fluttered closed. Still, one thought persisted. He only hoped it wasn't too late for his family. Chapter 9 Raven rushed from her home, leaving the CSI team to lock up after they'd processed her break-in. It couldn't be helped. Tony's wife, Yolanda, should not be alone at a time like this. God, don't die on me, Tony, please. The call she'd received from dispatch still resonated in her head, triggering a painful memory from her past. Her partner had been attacked and mortally wounded outside his house. Early reports indicated six armed gunmen were to blame. Although barely conscious, Tony had told fellow officers on the scene that his assailants had been mercenaries. Except for his wife, no other witnesses corroborated his story. 
Too much of a coincidence that this attack had happened on the same night Blair's killer paid her a visit. Whoever was behind this had flagrantly thumbed his nose at the police, with deadly consequence. On a deeply personal level, she grappled with the jumble of emotions in her mind. For the sake of Yolanda, Raven needed to dig deep for whatever strength lay buried under the despondency bubbling to the surface. Once again, violence had touched her life, jabbing at an unhealed wound. With Christian offering to drive her, she sat in the passenger seat of his car, letting silence build between them. Overhead streetlights lolled in and out of the darkened interior of his SUV. The mind-numbing road noise and the interminable drive time worsened her anxiety. For all she knew, Tony was already dead. Not Tony, not her partner. Nothing Christian could say would comfort her. Intuitively, he must have sensed this. He hadn't said a word since they started. Given his history, perhaps he was wrapped in his own brand of hell. So Raven focused on her partner, struggling to pray for him as Christian drove. Eventually, she closed her eyes and quit, fearing her prayers might do more harm than good. She had no right to ask for divine intervention now, not when she had turned her back on her faith all those many years ago. Her throat clenched as tears blurred her vision. With Christian by her side, she walked through the emergency doors at Mercy Hospital as they hissed open, numbed to the possibility of her partner's death. Her memory flooded with images from another wintry night when she was seventeen. This couldn't be happening. Not again. The waiting room hadn't changed, still colored in bland oatmeal and pale greens. With dour faces, the thick-skinned ER staff performed under pressure, handling desperation as if it were paperwork. Raven knew she filtered the scene through her own draining experience. She had blocked so much from her memory. But one remembrance had been etched in her mind. After being fatally shot, her father had never regained consciousness in the ICU. Thinking back to the day he died, she'd opted to sleep in, not getting up to make his breakfast on a Saturday morning. A part of her understood a father's absolution over the trivial incident, but as a daughter she was less forgiving. She'd never gotten a chance to tell him how much she loved him or to kiss him goodbye. As she spied Tony's wife down the corridor, she only hoped the woman would have at least that much. The lustrous olive skin of Yolanda Rodriguez looked pale, tinged with gray. Her dark, shoulder-length hair fell across her face as she paced the waiting room, clutching a wad of tissues. Her eyes brimmed with tears and inconsolable heartache. God, was she too late? Yolanda, is he— She couldn't bring herself to say it. How's he doing? Oh, God! Rushing to her, Yolanda collapsed in her arms, clinging to hope. Tell me this is all about dream, Raven. This c can't be happening. Her sobs escalated into spasms, words choking in her throat. I saw it all, and I c couldn't help him. The phones were out. I couldn't help. The feeling of powerlessness overwhelmed her as she held Yolanda. She knew the feeling all too well. What's happening, Yoli? Where is he? He's in surgery. Yolanda pulled from her arms. Her eyes barely met Raven's. But I saw it on the doctor's face. It doesn't look good, Raven. Don't borrow trouble by reading into anything. Tony would hate it if you gave up on him. You know how stubborn he is. She searched her heart for any words of comfort. Her partner's own words about borrowing trouble seemed so right. Where are the kids? Are they... Raven didn't know what to say. She knew firsthand that the kids weren't okay. Tonight, Tony's children had lost their innocence and their sense of security. Nothing would ever be the same again. They're at a neighbor's house. I didn't know what else to do. New tears drained down Yolanda's cheeks. I haven't called San Antonio to let his parents know. What am I going to tell them? After leading Yolanda to a nearby sofa, 
Raven sat beside her and rubbed the back of the woman's neck. None of this would be easy, and it had only just begun. Before she spoke, Christian interceded, handing them both a cup of coffee. It's going to be a long night. This might take the chill out of the room. She'd nearly forgotten about Christian. Awkwardly, she made the introductions, knowing Tony's wife would be paralyzed with worry. Yolanda Rodriguez, this is Christian Delacourt. He drove me. Any other explanation was far too complicated. I'm sorry to meet you under such terrible circumstances, Mrs. Rodriguez. If there's anything I can do... Christian's voice faded. He extended his hand, gently taking the woman's trembling fingers. Kneeling in front of her, Christian spoke to Yolanda in a hushed tone, meant for only her, but Raven was privileged to hear it all. I couldn't help but overhear. If you'll allow me, I'd like to offer the use of the Dunhill jet to transport Tony's parents to Chicago. Just give me the word and I can make it happen. Yolanda turned her heartbreaking gaze to Christian, as if seeing him for the first time. Fresh tears welled in her eyes, her lower lip quivered. Without a word, she reached for his neck and pulled him to her. By his reaction, it was evident. The intimacy surprised him. "'May God bless and keep you, Christian,' Yolanda whispered, clutching him to her embrace. "'Thank you so much for your generosity.' Raven sipped her coffee to choke back the emotion, witnessing the exchange. In that moment, she felt certain. Christian Delacourt had been fighting his demons, and still was, and he might never trust her enough to confide in her. But her trust barometer had not been wrong. Christian was a good man who deeply understood the pain of losing someone. The truth was as unmistakable as the tear rolling down his cheek. Chateau de Banville, Versailles, France In the pale pink of dawn, the chateau reflected off the still lake, a pastel gem against the blue of awakening sky. The image was crystal clear, like a photograph, in its perfection. Classic stone walls radiated a delicate pearled luster, Designed by Francois Mansart in the 1620s, the private residence was surrounded by exquisite gardens, accenting a spectacular fountain similar to the cascade at Louis XIV's Chateau de Marly. But despite the beauty of the pristine and tranquil setting, Fiona was a prisoner of her own volition, no longer enamored with the breathtaking opulence. Her heart longed for something beyond price, to be with Christian— in the chill of the early morning, she sat on the grass across the lake, gazing toward the grand chateau of a very dear old friend, her arms wrapped around her knees. Filling her lungs, she inhaled the earthy aroma of the water nuzzling the tall grasses. Even though her cheeks were still warm from her brisk walk through the wooded trails of the massive estate, she felt the cold creeping through the layers of her sweats and into her bones— the chill linked to troubling thoughts. Christian had been on her mind since she'd left Chicago, leaving him to face his unsettling future, alone. Late last night, it came to a head. She had a fit of conscience and placed a call to his Dunhill cottage. But when she heard his voice on the answering machine, emotion gripped her throat, and she lost her fleeting courage to speak. Perhaps it had been more from weakness that she made the call in the first place. She would gladly trade her wealth for his happiness. Yet for all her hollow wishes, she'd been the cause of his pain. All of it. And after her moment of frailty, she vowed that her past would not destroy his future. She must remain firm, for his sake. Slowly she stood and brushed off blades of grass from her clothing, her feet and legs numbed by the cold. From the start, desperation colored her world robbing her of a normal life. How long did she have to pay for her past indiscretion? She knew unfinished business loomed heavy in her future. She would not escape it. Captive to her sins, the prisoner returned to her gilded cell, uncertain of most things, except one. 
her unbearable solitude could not go on forever. Like the bite of the crisp morning, she felt it in her bones. The gray haze of daybreak arrived, migrating through small windows along the length of the room, at odds with a persistent nip in the air. Christian steadied his breathing to focus on anything but his discomfort, knowing his jacket had gone to a good cause. In the early morning hours, the waiting room to the ICU had grown quiet, leaving him alone with a sleeping raven Mackenzie. She had tried to stay alert, dosing herself with caffeine, but in the end, she had succumbed to exhaustion. The stillness they now shared held a sensual quality, like the intimacy of watching a sleeping lover. Or perhaps that was just wishful thinking on his part. Sitting in a chair, he stared at Raven from across the room, his elbows on the armrests with hands steepled under his chin. Curled up on an angular sofa not meant for the human body, she slept with her head propped against her balled-up coat. After she'd fallen asleep, he'd covered her in his leather jacket. In that instant, he discovered the innocence of a child in her serene face. Since he'd first met her, her expressions had ranged the gamut from fierce determination to anger, annoyance, and teasing humor. And he'd instigated most of those emotions, but seeing such innocence had been a charming surprise. Innocence, so rare in his world. With a quiet sigh, he let the stillness wash over him once again, a welcome respite from his life. Even though this lull felt like the eerie calm before the storm, the tragedy that had brought them together lingered heavy in the air. It stirred so much in him. The suffering and uncertainty in the eyes of Tony's wife were familiar. But he would take what he could get, relishing the simplicity of early morning and the promise of hope. In this room, time mercifully stalled, giving Tony precious minutes to find his way back to the living. Time became an infinite chasm, one without a beginning or an end. For the last several hours, he had watched Raven, dealing with the traumatic shooting of her partner, giving comfort to the man's wife, and making phone calls to the station house to keep the investigation into Tony's assault moving forward. A long line of police officers, including the chief himself, had come and gone through the ordeal. Seeing her with each of them, Christian sensed her connection. She was clearly part of a much larger family, a community that cared deeply for its own. And despite her personal feelings to the contrary, she found the courage to push through the pain, something he understood and respected. Catching her in those fragile moments, he supposed she might have believed she was alone with her fear and outrage. But he had been with her, supporting her with his presence. A silent vigil. It had been a privilege to see her through the eyes and hearts of others. No doubt, Detective Raven Mackenzie was a woman filled with compassion and courage, and this made it impossible for him to hate her as a cop. He felt the years of resentment in the pit of his stomach, embroiled amidst the violent images of his family tragedy. Enduring a lifetime of hate was exhausting. He'd grown bone-weary of the burden. Barely able to keep his eyes open, Christian rested his mind, counting what few blessings they had. For now, Raven's partner and friend was alive, but in critical condition. Every precious minute of life was a positive sign, but no guarantee he'd pull through. The man's wife sat with him in ICU, and Christian had arranged for the Dunhill jet to pick up Tony's parents from San Antonio. They'd be landing soon. And with their arrival, time would rush forward, drawing them into its undercurrent. Finally taking Raven's lead, he let his thoughts drift, relaxing their grip on him. As he did, the room dissolved to inky black when he shut his eyes, listening to the measured rhythm of Raven's breaths. Only a minute lapsed before the hospital intercom system jolted him awake, a muffled voice through the waiting room doors. Opening his eyes, he found Raven staring back. Her puzzled look softened to a warm welcome. You didn't have to wait, Christian. 
Under protest from the crinkling sofa, she sat upright, stretching her arms and straightening her must hair with a quick finger comb. But I'm glad you did. Good morning. Her voice was husky with sleep. The sound of it stirred him. Good morning. Can I get you some coffee? He offered. His voice barely above a whisper, he sat forward in his chair, elbows resting on his knees. And you should eat something before things get too hectic. When are Tony's parents getting here? She looked at her watch. They should be touching down any minute. The hangar will call when they've landed. Not sure I ever thanked you enough for that. His parents don't fly much. They would have gotten lost at a big airport like Midway or O'Hare on a normal day. She smiled, the emotion only fleeting. Her face darkened with a reminder of why they were sitting outside the ICU. But today is anything but normal. Before they get here, we should talk. He knew he had no right to express an opinion about police matters, but during the last few hours he'd been plagued with worry for Raven's safety. She narrowed her eyes at him, opening her mouth to speak, but he interjected, I overheard your conversation about Tony's assailants being mercenaries. This is police business, Christian. We're not sure if it's connected. Before she finished her thought, he called her on it. Bullshit. It's connected, all right. The break-in at your place, Tony's attack, and maybe even something tied to your father. It's not just about my past. Whoever killed Mickey is gunning for you now. And if mercenaries are involved, you'd need a small army to defend yourself. When Chief Markham was here earlier, he authorized 24-hour police protection for Tony and me. I'll be okay. All of this comes with the territory of being a cop, Christian. He stood abruptly, pacing the floor and pointing in her direction. Bullshit on that, too, Raven. According to the motto, your job is to protect and serve, not make yourself a target for some lunatic killer. I'll only buy that argument if they start issuing uniforms with bright red and white targets across the chest. Hearing how he must sound, he wanted to stop from making an ass of himself. But it was too late. He'd gone way past that now. His voice raised, he continued his tirade, and for every cop pulled off duty to protect you, Tony, and his family, that's one less cop to find this SOB. Rising from the sofa, she tossed aside his jacket and confronted him. With her brow furrowed, she stood her ground, hands on her hips. He knew the woman would not make this easy. And what do you propose I do about that? Believe me, I hate the fact that I've been assigned protection. I refused it, but the chief insisted, pulling rank on me. Her eyes bore the weight of her emotion, second only to her pale skin flushed with anger. Punctuating her outburst, she crossed her arms. But the bastard that attacked Tony is going to pay for what he did. I got plenty of cops willing to do whatever it takes to find this guy. There won't be a place he can hide. I'm going to see to that. Let me help you, he insisted, aroused by her fire. The woman was fearless. Help me? You're not officially off the suspect list for crying out loud. I'm not sure I can trust you. Are you forgetting about your own secret agenda? With her chin jutting forward, she amassed the attitude, standing close enough for him to smell her warm skin. Or must I remind you, Captain Cryptic? He watched her nostrils flare, her breast heaved in maddening swells. The heat from her skin seduced him. Raven orchestrated his body's reaction with the precision of a symphony conductor. Bellowing with the resonance of a bass drum, his heart pounded his ribcage, the sensation intoxicating. For only an instant, she lowered her lids and gazed at his lips. With innocence gone, a desirable woman stood before him. Her eyes held him spellbound. She seemed to understand his intention even before he fully grasped it himself. An impulse struck him like a blindsided sucker punch. Without his usual deliberation, Christian merely reacted, following his instincts. Standing so close to Raven, he felt her pull like a force of gravity. His hands reached for her, 
taking on a life of their own. He had no will to stop. One arm found the small of her back, drawing her toward him. His right hand caressed her cheek, his fingertips stroking her velvet softness. At first her dark eyes brimmed with shock at his bold move. Tension made her body taut, but just as suddenly she collapsed into his arms, reeling with his impulsive intimacy. In his embrace her body nestled warm against him, fitting into place as if he were made to hold her. With a faint tremble to her lips she beckoned him with her surrender, her eyes enticing him once more, and the sweet fragrance of her skin filled him with the courage to take the next step. "'I want you,' his voice trailed off. Overwhelmed by his urge, he gave her every opportunity to stop before it was too late. "'Entirely too much dialogue, Delacorte.' Her voice sultry, she closed the gap between them. Kiss me, damn it. Slowly, he lowered his lips to hers. With a touch, the softness of her delicate skin sent shock waves firing through his body. He pressed for more. Gently parting her lips, his tongue took liberties, finding her just as eager. The sensual barrage jolted his senses, short-circuiting his brain with gratification. Skin flushed with heat, he grew rigid, his body straining against his pants. Fleeting control gave way to insatiable appetite as his hands eagerly explored soft mounds of flesh, and she responded in kind, equaling his growing desire. She tugged at his shirt-tail and slipped her hands next to his raging skin. God, he never knew it could be like this. He felt such a connection to this woman. Far more powerful than his physical hunger for her, he savored the deepening bond between them. Blocking out all other sensation, he wanted to focus on every inspired nuance of her, to give her pleasure. The room faded into nothingness. The sound of her throaty sighs and the arousing scent of her skin dominated him. Only Raven mattered. Only she touched something within him, something he thought he'd lost. Only she made him forget. And damn it! Only he would get a phone call during a time like this. The vibration of his cell phone nudged him back to reality. He would have ignored it, but with the phone hooked to his belt, its pulsating signal reached out and touched her, too. She jumped, and with that, he'd been disappointed to learn that the tingling he felt in the pit of his stomach had not been entirely prompted by the alluring woman standing before him. "'Is that your cell phone, or are you just happy to see me?' Breathlessly, she teased him, hunger and frustration still vivid in her eyes. Her breasts swelled against his chest as she clung to him, nearly driving him crazy. Oh, I'm definitely happy to see you. His breathing rapid, Christian leaned his forehead against hers, his hands still cradling her body. And I'd like to see much more of you, believe me. Forget the visual aids. I'm a tactile girl. Hold that thought. Reluctantly, he turned to one side, pulling from her embrace. Flipping the cell phone, he put the receiver to his ear. Yeah, Delacorte here. I'd like to hold more than just a thought, Christian, she muttered. As he talked on the phone, she nuzzled against his back. Raven wrapped her arms across his belly and burrowed her warm hands under his shirt. His taut muscles reacted to her touch, making the phone call a challenge. He turned toward her, slipping the phone back to his belt. It's the hangar. The jet is touched down. Tony's parents are going to be here within the half hour. His finger brushed a strand of hair behind her ear. Raven cupped a hand to his cheek, with a warm palm pressed against his chest. Even through his shirt, her touch aroused him beyond reason and the suggestive timbre of her voice soothed him like warm honey in July. Look, I don't want you worrying about me. 
her eyes softened to a rich mocha, a kaleidoscope of raw sensuality. Bathed in her light, he couldn't keep his hands from her. Every touch felt like redemption. But reality struck home when she added, The coward that attacked Tony and skulked into my house won't be able to get past the police protection. I'm going to be okay. With a sly smile, she spoke softly. Besides, I think the real danger is what just happened between us. They don't make an asbestos suit for that kind of combustion. She ran her thumb across his lower lip, teasing his memory, attempting to distract him from worry. For a moment, he just stared at her, unsure if she was joking. Despite a clear sense of foreboding, he let a lazy smile tug at the corners of his mouth. Somehow the woman found a way to yank him from the doldrums, and once again he let impulse rule the day. I want you to stay with me at the Dunhill estate. I've got the manpower to protect you, and your brothers in blue can focus on finding the man that hurt Tony. I'm sure whoever did this is behind Mickey Blair's murder, too. I think you're right, at least about a connection to the Blair case. But you've got to let me do my job, Christian, on my terms. I can't just run and hide. In his arms, she gazed up at him. He wanted nothing more than to take her home with him to make love to this beautiful woman. But Raven was a cop, and something in his past had drawn a killer to her door. Seeing the audacity of this cold-blooded butcher, he knew that twenty-four-hour police protection wouldn't be enough. For her sake, he had to get to the bottom of it all, without destroying Fiona in the process. As if sensing his conflict, she grew somber. Compassion filled her eyes. I'm not sure you trust me enough to confide your role in all of this. I have no doubt that the case is linked to your past. Let me help you find the truth. I gotta believe that together we can do this, but you're gonna have to reach out to me. I won't betray your faith. She vowed, "Promise me you'll think about it." If only it were that easy to believe in Raven. She made that part effortless, but the life of someone else teetered on the brink, someone he loved as much as his own mother. Even though he didn't understand why she'd left the country, it didn't matter. Fiona was depending on him, and he wouldn't let her down, not even if it meant keeping secrets from Raven. I promise. He whispered, kissing her cheek. The beautiful homicide detective had given him a great deal to think about. She'd read the same line countless times. Once again, Fiona set down the book on her lap, a restless feeling burning just beneath the surface of her skin. Despite the comforter over her legs and the warmth from the heavily brocaded chair, she shuddered. Her skin prickling with a distant anxiety. Her eyes drifted toward the large picture window, draped in muted gold. Sunlight filtered through the opaque shears, daubing ribbons of light across the massive pastel rug at her feet. Even imagining the heat from the sun, she couldn't shake an uneasy feeling. The fire in the hearth popped and hissed in warning, making her jump with its prompting. A faint gasp whispered through her lips. In this remote area of the world, far from her past life, she should have felt more secure. Despite her best efforts to ignore it, fear refused to be conquered. Footsteps echoed down the corridor outside the library. Staring at the lavishly carved wooden doors at the entrance to the room, she waited and held her breath, and with certainty she knew, her time was up. She stood and filled her lungs, resigning herself to the inevitable. Brushing off her dark gray slacks and straightening her black cashmere sweater, she raised her chin and pulled back her shoulders, swallowing the lump in her throat. Armand stood by the door, softly clearing his throat. Pardon me, Madame, but you have a very insistant visitor. The manservant tightened his lips. As I was instructed, I gave no indication you were staying here at the chateau, but the man insists upon seeing you. What would you have me do, Madame Donil? 
clenching her jaw, Fiona turned and walked toward the window to pull back the sheer fabric. Her eyes lowered to the circular drive below. As she expected, fate had come to Versailles. Chapter 10 You look lovely, Fiona. I'd nearly forgotten. His voice resonated through the formal parlor with its twenty-foot ceiling, the sound of his footsteps intruding upon his feigned cordiality. He'd entered the grand salon with a confident swagger, breezing toward her, dapper and dashing in his elegant navy suit. But as he neared, a reserve swept over him and now rested in his eyes of blue-violet. She hadn't seen eyes that color before or since. Truly, the man was one of a kind. Well, let's just say it's been a very long time. Nicholas Charbonneau held out his hand, beckoning for hers. She lowered her eyes to the soft skin of his palm, resisting the memory of how that hand had once given her such pleasure. A lifetime, Nicky. That name. She hadn't spoken his name aloud for decades. Fiona hoped he hadn't seen the slight tremble as she gripped his hand. His eyes firmly entrenched in hers, Nicky held her fingers and brushed a thumb across the back of her hand. A suggestive move. To counter her weakness, a show of strength would be in order. She refused to dissolve under the pressure of his mesmerizing blue eyes. I thought I covered my tracks fairly well. No flight plans, a private airstrip at a friend's personal residence, paying off the French government to turn a blind eye. How did you find me, Nicky? Keeping her hand in his, she was determined not to give in to his obvious show of intimidation by pulling away. Fiona forced a smile, the best she could do. The first rule in the art of bribery, my dear— Never trust anyone who'd accept a bribe in the first place. A rather amazing paradox, really. He lowered his chin and tilted his head, unrelenting in his gaze. Actually, I cheated. You'll find a tracking beacon on your plane, just inside one of the wheel wells. With a haunting smile she knew well, he eventually released his grip on her. And in the wake of his touch... She didn't know which felt worse. The warmth of his skin lingered in contradiction, her fondest and worst memory. Otherwise, I'd say yours was a grand scheme. It would have worked on your standard fare of pursuers. His deep voice grew thick with intimacy. He stood close enough for her skin to tingle at the sound of its familiarity. She turned her back on him, unable to steady her breathing. But as she stepped away, she caught a glimpse of him in the massive beveled mirror above the mantel of the marbled hearth. For a split second, a guileless younger man appeared in the reflection. Past and present stared her in the face. The image disturbed her. She flinched and shut her eyes for a moment. Fighting for control, she allowed sarcasm to imply a strength she did not possess. How utterly gracious of you, Nicky! Your charm knows no bounds. She claimed an ornately carved and gilded armchair with vivid yellow brocade set beside the fire. Fiona appreciated the symbolism. She'd always been the moth flitting too near the flame. But it appears you didn't take the hint. I didn't want any visitors. I thought you'd make an exception for me, Fiona, since we are such old and dear friends. He stalled just long enough to make his point. Nicky never said anything without careful consideration and orchestration, yet perhaps his ego far outweighed his discretion. As she thought back over what he had just revealed— a new question summoned her curiosity. For now, she would bide her time, watching him. Following her toward the fire, he stood with his hand on the mantel, staring into its flames. A warm glow radiated upon him, outlining a handsome face ablaze in gold. 
His admirable good looks had seasoned well with age. She trailed her fingers along that strong jawline, known the softness of those full lips, and lost her soul to those eyes. That's why his offense provoked her, compounded by his deceit. It had been an act of betrayal to what remained in her memory of Nicky. Why are you here, Nicholas? Fiona hoped the use of his formal first name would remind him. She only used it in anger. And why would you plant the tracking device on my jet ahead of time, unless you knew I'd be taking a hasty trip abroad? Did you play some part in the abruptness of my departure? Seeing the slight flicker to his eyes, she knew she'd been right. He had arranged for the murder of a man. But why? How had love twisted into such a vile thing? In disbelief, she waited for his response to her challenge. But as expected, his break in composure had been instantaneous, gone as quickly as it appeared. Slowly, his expression morphed into a sneer as his eyes shifted toward her. My, aren't you the clever one? He smiled, with all the seductiveness of a snake coiled in high grass. Are you insinuating I had anything to do with your most recent misfortune, my dear? And what might that be, Nicky? Misfortune. I wouldn't exactly characterize my life as unfortunate. She stiffened, raising her chin in feigned arrogance and pride. Quite the contrary. His jaw tightened as he backed from the fire. Finding a chair opposite her, he sat and leaned an elbow onto an armrest. Resting his chin on his fist, he stared, unreadable. A faint pull at the corner of his mouth reminded her how much he enjoyed a good verbal joust, but not if his opponent held the upper hand. Perhaps you can live with your sins better than most. His hurtful words hung in the air for her to examine at length. The simple observation gnarled her stomach, entangling it with the bitter truth. What did he know? How could he— Uncertainty prickled the skin of her face, forcing an unsettling blink to her eyelids. She conceded his clever insight. Her lungs burned from lack of air. She reminded herself to breathe. Just breathe. At that instant, the bittersweet image of him as a lover invaded her mind without mercy. He'd been kind and generous once. Remorse over what might have been tugged at her heart. Though hardness tinged his eyes now, she still remembered love brimming in his gaze as they lay beneath white linens, his skin flush with satiation. Some things are not easily forgotten, Nicky. A knot wedged in her throat. She didn't know what to add, to make him understand. Even if she told him everything, nothing would be gained by it. Too much had happened, far too many secrets. Despite the vast wealth between them, neither of them could turn back the clock and reclaim a life that could have been. It appears you've changed, Fee. The severity of his expression softened, reflecting the regret she felt. You used to avoid unpleasantness. Now you indulge in it. Money and power have seduced you. Oh, how he'd misread her. Her eyes blurred, drowning in tears. The sting of his accusation hit her hard, like an unexpected slap to the face. Futilely, she held back her emotion. But a tear betrayed her, exposing her weakness and Nicky witnessed her defeat. A tear rolled down her face, its path glistening at the fire's edge. In his lifetime, her beauty had struck him many times, one of the more memorable being the day she'd willingly surrendered her virtue to him, a precious gift given only once. But none of these instances, grouped in aggregate, moved him as greatly as this moment. Such power reigned in the grace of a single tear. He felt defeated before he'd even begun. She wrung her hands, allowing her frailty to show for the first time since he'd entered the room. 
Many times he'd rehearsed this conversation in his mind, yet none of it went as planned. He hadn't counted on his reaction at seeing her for the first time since she was nineteen years old. And if it were possible, she was more beautiful now than he remembered. Dismissing such sentiment, he pressed with the cruelty he'd honed over the years, cultivated by her denial of his affections. He wanted desperately to regain control, at her expense. Is that regret I see in your eyes, Fiona, or pure, unadulterated guilt? How do you live with the harsh reality of having hired the assassination of your dearly departed husband, Charles? Was the money that important to you? Shock jarred her. Through the tears, resentment leached to the surface, all at his hand. I have no idea what you're talking about. Her words denied him, but the sternness and the staunch resolve in her tone spoke volumes. She knew exactly what he implied. And why now? Why are you just now coming forward after all this time? It's been twenty-five years since Charles died. Was killed, Fiona. Charles was murdered. A sniper bullet, as I recall. I suppose you'd blame the hazards of the job. Being the head of a crime family has its disadvantages. For my part, let's just say I'm weary of the competition. He was too clever to spell everything out for her. He'd tolerated their head-to-head -head arms trading endeavors up till now, but when he'd used a freelancing Mickey Blair for another job, he'd learned the man had worked as Dunhill Security for more than twenty-five years, a curious fact for a hired assassin. The link to Fiona was too tantalizing to pass up. After a discreet background check, he'd put two and two together. Now, with the truth painfully obvious in her eyes, he knew he'd been right about Fiona's guilt. His gamble had paid off. But to use Christian Delacourt, Fiona's charity case, as a pawn in their chess match, his part had been masterfully played. She'd given a life to Delacourt, keeping him apart from her criminal endeavors, perhaps buying the love of a troubled child to create some semblance of family. Irony of ironies. His rival would be imploded from within, at the hands of an innocent. Checkmate, Fiona. Defeat was manifest in her eyes, a culmination to his wicked scheme, the pinnacle of his success. So why did he not feel victorious? So this has all been about business, even after all these years? She raised up, moving to the edge of her seat. His silence was her only reply. Then Fiona did something he hadn't expected. She knelt at his feet. Her hand softly touched his as she gazed at him, weariness etched in her face. The emerald green of her eyes brimmed in misery. Her voice was only a whisper. I never stopped loving you, Nicky. You know how Charles was. He would have killed you if he'd found out about us. I couldn't let that happen. With fresh tears, she urged him to understand, clutching his hand. It would have meant a war between the families. A vendetta. No one wins, and so many would have died needlessly. Charles wasn't a man to be trusted. If you only knew— I know about trust-broken Fiona. We could have— No use rehashing the past. He let the words flounder in his throat, replacing them with the question he truly wanted to ask. If you still love me, why didn't you say anything before now? She pulled her hand from his and swallowed hard. Fiona couldn't look him in the eye. She was hiding something. You claim to love me, yet you keep your secrets. Why? he pleaded, hearing the heartache in his voice, despising the weakness she provoked. Why? Some decisions are better left in the past, not dredged up for the world to see. 
It's not just about you and me anymore. What did she mean? For him, it had always been about her. He hadn't been the same since the first time he saw her all those many years ago. His successes, his competitiveness, all of it had been posturing for her. He'd never married, hoping she'd surrender to him. With her rejection even now, so much had been for naught. Yet the ultimate question still lay before him. Would he knowingly destroy her now? Could he kill the last vestiges of the young idealistic man he used to be when he was with her? And some decisions are a result of the past, a past unwilling to stay buried, he contradicted. Nicholas stood and gazed upon her, a lump rising in his throat. Crumpled at his feet, she looked broken. Her youthful innocence was gone, displaced by an agonizing love that had somehow endured. But he knew all about that. In their youth, love had burned hot like a flame, wildly flickering and dancing for all to see. When she married another man, he believed that fire to be snuffed for good. Yet unexpectedly, today, he found the red glow of a fiery ember in her eyes, still raging against all odds. It caught him by complete surprise. And you're wrong, Fee. It has always been about you and me. Stepping around her, he walked away, unable to look back. Instead, he focused on his hollow footsteps. The sound nearly drowned out the regret heard in her choking sobs. The splendor of the grand chateau drifted by in a blur. He felt numb. He couldn't turn around. If he had, he might never want to leave. He's asking for you. I see you, room eight. Yolanda smiled weakly. Raven could tell the woman was exhausted. He doesn't have the strength for a long visit, but I'm afraid you're going to have to be the judge of that. He's so stubborn. Raven stood, rushing to Tony's wife with open arms. Closing her eyes, she held the woman firmly in her embrace, willing her strength. How are you holding up? When they parted, Yolanda shrugged without complaint. I'm going to take his parents to the chapel, maybe get some coffee in the cafeteria. Unspoken emotion lay just beneath the surface of her words. Come find me if... I will. Quick to speak up, Raven didn't allow her to finish the thought. Before leaving, Yolanda stepped toward Christian, who'd risen from the sofa when she entered the waiting room. He wants to see you too, Christian. With a smile, she reached for his hand and kissed it. Me? Delacourt questioned. Yes, you. I'm sure he'd like to thank you for bringing his parents to Chicago. I could tell your generosity surprised him. No doubt. Christian nodded, directing a sheepish look toward Raven. He looked unworthy, like an instigator of a prank that turned out to be mistaken for an act of kindness. But she knew better. After Yolanda left the room, Raven turned toward Christian. You heard the man. He wants to see us both. She swept her arm to the ICU room, encouraging him. Reluctantly, he stood his ground, stuffing his hands into his jeans pockets. You go. He doesn't need to thank me for anything. The aw shucks routine was adorable, but Raven understood her partner. Oh, believe me, I know that man in there. He has more to say than just thanks. Trust me on that one. Christian narrowed his eyes at her, then slowly nodded again. She knew he was bracing himself for an audience with the ingratiating cop who'd attempted to serve him lousy coffee while setting him up for a subtle interrogation, all in the name of law and order. Lead the way, he sighed. A flood of memories filled Raven's mind as she walked slowly down the sterile corridor of the ICU. Medical science blended its own pungent concoction of vague medicinal odors and pine cleaner, with a dash of human secretions laced in anxiety and hope. She avoided a curious glance into open doorways, not wanting to invade the privacy of the seriously ill who shared her partner's plight. Room number eight was the fourth door to the right, the only room with an attendant dressed in blue seated outside. 
Raven kept her eyes focused on the sympathetic gaze from a young police officer stationed at Tony's door, who stood as she neared. She acknowledged his service with a nod, the first shift of the twenty-four hour police protection for the Rodriguez family. The assignment of the young officer meant her days of freedom were numbered. Soon she'd be hampered with an entourage of her own. The thought saddened her, but nothing prepared her for what followed, seeing Tony for the first time after his assault. Standing at the threshold of her partner's room, Raven shuddered, a faint gasp fresh from her lips. She'd never seen him so weak and lost. Tubes and machinery sustained him. Tony looked so frail and thin, his skin pale from blood loss. It was as if the muscles of his body had atrophied overnight. With his eyes closed, he had the appearance of a corpse, except for the steady beep of his heart monitor. Christian sensed her shock and grasped her shoulder, saying, He's alive, and on the right side of the dirt. That counts for something. At the sound of Christian's voice, Tony opened his eyes with a sluggish effort. In his condition, it took him a moment to place Raven's face, but once he had, a weak smile crossed his lips. His lips moved to say her name, but opted for a simpler version. Mac. The doctor said you were lucky. You're going to be okay. Pulling up a chair next to his bed, she gently squeezed his hand, knowing precious little of his medical condition. With effort, Tony filled his lungs with a shallow and unsteady pant. The man knew the difference between wishful thinking and the truth, possessing sure-fire radar to detect bullshit, but it didn't stop her from trying. They were Merck's raven. Laser scalps. His voice nothing but raspy air, dry and faint. Connected to b Blair. Be careful. She had kept the break-in at her house a secret from him and Yolanda. They both had enough to deal with. Tony's dark eyes already communicated his concern for her safety. Even with his life still at risk, he worried for her. God, how she loved this man. Listen to me, Tony Rodriguez. You've only got one job while you're here, and that is to stay alive. You hear me? Prove to that bastard that he can't keep a macho man like you down. A Tex-Mex is hard to kill. She smiled through the tears filling her eyes, choking back the lump in her throat. She tightened her grip on his cold fingers. I love you, Tony. Leaning closer, she kissed his cheek. One of her tears doused his skin, mingling with his own. She brushed it away with a thumb. Take care of me, hermana. He returned the sentiment in Spanish, adding an endearment she'd come to recognize. My sister. Tony was family now, and her family needed protection. Wiping the tears from her face, she steeled herself for a fight. Under the cover of darkness, Blair's killer was a coward, resorting to an assault on an unsuspecting off-duty police officer in clear sight of his family. Unfortunately, in this quietly raging society, retribution against the police had become prevalent, and often for minor offenses such as traffic citations. How screwed up do you have to be to kill over a parking ticket? Tony looked tired, barely able to keep his eyes open. But she knew he wasn't done. In case anything happens, he swallowed and tightened his grip on her hand, fighting back a deepening shroud of pain in his eyes. Please take care of my family. Golly is strong, but... Raven opened her mouth to reject his withering hope, but now wasn't the time to deny him anything. Even though she refused to believe he might die, something as small as an errant blood clot could seal his fate, a familiar complication for gunshot wounds. Clenching her jaw, she assured him, You know I will. A weak smile faded from his face. 
she knew her promise gave him comfort. Staring into his eyes, she let the contented silence build between them. Without words, Tony was preparing her for the worst. Oh, no, you don't. She nearly choked on the realization. You're giving me that all-knowing Yoda stare, the one that says I shouldn't question my training officer. Despite the humor in her words and a crooked half-smile, a tear contradicted her message. You taught me everything, Tony, and I know you're just too damned ornery to die. I got my stubborn streak from you. Not so, grasshopper. You came by that honestly from your old m man. The old Tony glimmered just beneath the surface of his pain, too frail to emerge. Is Christian here? I'd like to talk to him alone. Faced with reality, she discovered her partner was breakable after all. But leaving him to the care of others went against the woman she was and her training. Tony released his grip from her fingers, letting go. He's here, Tony. Glancing over her shoulder, she nodded her encouragement for Delacourt to take her place. She ran fingers down Christian's arm as he stood by her side. Even in Tony's weakened condition, he hadn't missed Raven's subtle gesture of affection. Her partner rarely missed a thing. This your idea of vacation time? Once they were alone, Christian sat beside Tony's bed, lightly touching the man's arm to make a connection. Raven will tell you I'd do, do anything for a little attention. Even in jest, Tony covered his pain, garnering his strength. Thanks for my parents. You getting better is thanks enough, and your mom promised to make me some habanero hot sauce that'll rip my head off. That's all the gratitude I can handle. Christian stood to leave, but Tony grabbed his arm. The act of kindness toward my family. You seem like a good man. With his eyes, he beckoned for Christian to lean closer, the man's voice barely above a whisper. She won't back down from this. I know how she is. These men are organized and d dangerous. Please take care of her, of Raven. Sitting down, Christian nodded. I plan to do just that, at least until you're back on your feet. Christian tilted his head, patiently waiting for relief to show on Tony's face. I agree with you. She needs someone to watch her back. Any bastard that would do what they did to you and your family deserves— He stopped, mid-sentence. He struggled to control his anger. It was hard to let go of the past, but for Raven and Fiona's sake, he had to get beyond it. Self-pity wasn't an option. I was hoping you'd say that. Thank you. The wounded detective grimaced. Now I gotta heal up. I'm gonna eat everything. Anything they put in f front of me, even if the food kills me. That's my plan. If that's the best you can come up with, you must be hurting. Christian reached for Tony's wrist, giving it a gentle shake. Take care, man. After leaving the ICU room, he quietly walked down the corridor toward the waiting room with Raven by his side. Numb to his surroundings, he was steeped in thought. He'd spent his whole life building a foundation of resentment toward the police, and in a matter of days he had come to grips with the frailty of that cornerstone. Dread gnawed at his belly. So hard to let go of the hatred. He'd nurtured it for so long, believing it fortified him, but perhaps his changed feelings toward the police and Raven Mackenzie would serve a purpose, to help him search for the truth alongside a very unexpected ally. Someone sinister had risked a great deal to stir up the past, killing a man to make a very public point. None of it made sense. Who had passed judgment on Mickey? 
and why had they picked Christian to bring the truth to light? Time to find the answers. The jet engine droned, making it easy to block out the world. He stared out the small window, his eyes not fixed on anything in particular. Night settled upon him as he left France, embracing him in black velvet, only a dress rehearsal for the real thing. With the time difference, he'd gain hours, landing on American soil to experience sunset in its finality, like opening night at the theater when little else remained but to raise the curtain. Feathery tufts drifted by, weightless. He felt lost in them. The world had grown smaller, and he had been the cause. Nicholas Charbonneau replayed his long-awaited confrontation with Fiona in his mind. The woman held firm to her secrets. He knew when she was avoiding the truth. At least he thought he could tell. So much time had been squandered between them, dulling his understanding of the only woman who'd made him vulnerable to love. The steady vibration of his cell phone pulled him from his self-inflicted misery. He considered not answering the call, but his better judgment forced him to reach for his tether to the present. Speak. I thought you should know. Without greeting, the woman got down to business. The sensual voice of Mantis prickled his ear. Normally, her lusty tone conjured up delightful images of his lethal flower, but only one woman plagued him now, lurking in the shadows of his memory. Yes, Jasmine, what is it? His curt tone would be noticed. The young woman was most sensitive to his needs. The prolonged silence on the other end of the line confirmed it. Finally she spoke. You should have let me come with you, she admonished tenderly. Are you okay, Nikki? Rarely had he ever heard such doubt in her voice. The unexpected quiver of blame troubled him. He didn't like this sign of weakness in himself, nipping at his potency. It came much too naturally and without warning. Was he suddenly developing a conscience? Briefly, he shut his eyes, dismissing the thought. I will be. Where are you? Perilously lost in suburbia, counting my blessings that I met you. How do people live like this? I doubt I will ever understand the endearing qualities of the minivan. The disgust in her tone had returned. Jasmine was never sentimental for long. You were right. Our ravenous predator is hunting. And as you predicted, he lacks subtlety and any semblance of discretion. Under the surface of her sulking, childlike voice slithered the menace of death that he found most appealing. Sensuality and murderous intent wrapped in one tantalizing package. Nicholas had assigned his bodyguard to discreetly tail Logan McBride, suspecting the man would tempt fate by disregarding his not-so-subtle warning at their last rendezvous. Yet he had to admit the vulgar man had been right. An animal does remain true to its nature. He's marking his territory, pissing where he doesn't belong, she warned, her femininity neatly disguised by her crude choice of words, a delicious paradox. Even using a high-tech, secured phone, Mantis always avoided any incriminating references. A gesture he appreciated. She cautioned that McBride had escalated his interest in the fair detective who was investigating Blair's murder. He had dangled the detective as incentive to McBride for a job well done, not realizing the bonus would be more like tossing blood in shark-infested waters. Perhaps the man wasn't as predictable as he'd once imagined. And he paid a visit to the other. I believe we should send flowers to the hospital, or the mortuary, she added in a grim tone. The outcome hasn't been decided. Silence. 
His once useful contractor knew better than to lead police to his door. But the man had launched his own campaign of retribution without regard to his warning. Anger surged deep inside his chest. To a point, McBride's vile nature had been custom made for his little endeavor. Now the man had outgrown his usefulness. Tension set his jaw, but his voice remained steady. I will be landing later this evening. Keep in contact if there are any further developments. By the time I arrive, I shall have a plan to remedy the situation. I look forward to it, she purred. And, Nikki, when I see you, I will have a remedy of my own concoction. Her purposeful diction and the intimacy of her voice pierced the distance between them. Guaranteed to make you forget your troubles. Until then, Mantis. He ended the call, turning his attention once more to the clouds spiraling by his window. On the horizon, the sea of soft texture held substance, backlit by the fire of a waning sun. Light gained its fleeting stronghold, spearing its tendrils through holes in the sky. The constant struggle between light and dark was a battle doomed to failure from both sides. A winner would never be declared. Considering himself a poet with an appreciation for bloodlust, he appreciated the analogy. If only it were that simple, my dear. If only, he whispered. She thought the day would never end. Her eyes felt thick with exhaustion, an ache overwhelmed her muscles. As Raven drove up to her house, accompanied by the two squad cars assigned to her, darkness settled. A trace chill of violation still lingered in her memory. Her safe haven had been forever tainted by the break-in. Turning the key to the side entrance off the carport, she glanced overhead, remembering her intruder had pulled the bulb from her security light. It would have to be replaced. Uncharacteristically, she drew her weapon to walk into her dark kitchen, Lieutenant Sam Winters at her side. Though pitch black, the room echoed its emptiness. She knew they were alone. As she flipped on the lights, the aftermath of her ruined dinner with Christian doused her with melancholy. The tainted aroma of spaghetti sauce hung in the air, its remains still splattered on the stovetop. The image forged its imprint on her mind. Backing up Lieutenant Winters, she conducted a search of her home before lowering her glock. Her fellow officer and family friend had volunteered to oversee the night shift. Close to retirement, he had partnered with Raven's father and visited her house on many occasions. Her first night under police protection would be strained enough, but she felt reassured having Sam watch over her. We'll be setting up in front and back. You know the drill. The last of the cowboys went out with John Wayne. You're no gunslinger, so call us if you hear anything. Sam's face had been shaped by his years. Deeply furrowed laugh lines branded him a character. Red hair infused with gray stood on end, defying gravity. She had seen his stern grimace whenever he glowered at a suspect, but that expression melted away completely when he relaxed amidst friends. Like a stubborn cowlick unwilling to behave, his face sprang routinely into a crooked smirk. She knew firsthand that his scowl took much more effort. Sam's warm smile comforted her now, reminding her how much the man made her father laugh. I've got a thermos or two. How about I make some coffee for you and the troops? She grinned, not wanting to be alone so soon. You can keep me company while it's brewing. We can talk while I clean up this mess. Whoa, what happened to your old man's photo? He reached for the framed memento, ruined by dried tomato sauce. You trying a new recipe? Not me. The bastard that broke in here added his own special ingredient. Working around the mess, Raven busied herself with the coffee prep as she spoke, filling the pot with water from the sink. But I'm glad we can talk about this, Sam. 
When you and Dad partnered, were there any hard cases that come to mind that could do such a thing? After prying open the lid to the coffee, she scooped out the dark, rich-smelling granules. Raven restrained a smile. Ever since associating Christian Delacourt with the pungent aroma of freshly brewed coffee, she couldn't think of Java without conjuring sensual images of him. Truth be told, everything reminded her of Delacourt these days. She had it bad. From the message on my bathroom mirror, the guys connected to the Blair murder too. My gut tells me the S.O.B. knew my dad. Give me some time to think about that, baby girl. I can dig through some old case files too. The man ridged his brow in irritation. I hate it that this psycho has singled you out. The world sure has gotten twisted. He pulled back a chair from the breakfast table and flipped it around, straddling the seat and resting his meaty forearms across the back. Shoving his glasses down the bridge of his ample nose, he lowered his chin to gaze over the top of the frames, his mustache animating his upper lip. You know, back when your daddy and I rode together, we didn't have all these high-tech laptops in our patrol cars and GPS for the dispatchers to know where we were every friggin' pea break. With coffee gurgling. Raven sprayed down her countertops and waged war on the tomato splatter. She'd heard this commentary from Sam many times before, and if she closed her eyes, her father's memory rang clear. It felt good to remember him. Hell, these days every cop has got a video cam in the dash and a triple encrypted communication system more like the CIA. We even got our own TV show and theme song. He shook his head and grinned, a twinkle of mischief in his eyes. And don't you dare start singing it, L.T. She pointed a threatening finger in his direction, like it was loaded. Sounds like you missed the good old days. I'm not complaining, mind you. We need all that shit just to keep up, and the world keeps churning out sick bastards for us to clean up after. Talk about job security. And your guy is no exception. What he did to Tony really chaps my hairy butt. Pardon my French. Raven stopped working with the mention of her partner's name, remembering how much Tony enjoyed the man's company. He'd often egg him on, trying to bait him for a rowdy discussion on the good old days. But Sam was the most politically incorrect person she knew, from his chauvinistic terms of endearment to his colorfully inventive curses. It tickled her to think he was now asking her forgiveness for his French. After being a cop for so long, she'd heard it all. Most probably, he only wanted permission to embellish. I find it ironic that we got ourselves a war on drugs, funded in part by seized drug money. Which comes first, the whopping big golden egg or the tight ass chicken? All I know is that's gotta hurt. You know what I mean? She'd been right. He saved the best for last, mixing fables and old sayings in typical Sam fashion. Staring him straight in the eye, she nodded her head as if she agreed, then said, "No, have no clue, and it scares me to think you do. But I love you anyway." Fighting a grin, she poured hot coffee into two thermoses. As he stood, she shoved the containers in a crook of his arm. Draw the drapes and stay away from the windows. He smirked, drumming a knuckle on her forehead with affection to make his point. And start leaving a light on inside. Why? I'm not afraid of the dark. Reacting too quickly, Raven lied about her fear of the dark, afraid to show her sign of weakness. Oh, it's not for you, darling. I call it target acquisition. If I have to come in here, gun drawn, I want to see what I'm aiming at. Okay, I'll concede the point. And just in case you hear any noises outside, I'm gonna have our guys take regular walks around the perimeter. It'll keep 'em sharp. You know what they say: the brains can only take what the tail end can stand. With a wink, he cheered her with a grin. Thanks for the coffee, sweetness, and I'll get back to you on those old case files. 
Before he walked out the door, he turned back, a serious expression on his face. I probably don't say this enough, Raven, but your old man would have been proud. She rubbed his shoulder, squeezing it gently. Thanks, Sam, for everything. Down the block, well out of sight, Logan sat behind the wheel in the dark, clenching his jaw until it ached. The damned police thought a couple of cruisers would deter him. Nothing could be further from the truth. His men were well-trained and loyal to his command. To get at Raven Mackenzie, he was certain nothing could stop him. And bloodying a few more blue uniforms held no significance. Retrieving his cell phone, he punched a speed dial number. A man answered on the second ring. Yeah, Vinny, call the party off for tonight. She's got visitors, Logan ordered. Earlier, he'd thought about sending someone else to do reconnaissance, but after seeing the young detective in the shower, he decided to do the job himself. He wouldn't share her with anyone. Kruger's gonna be disappointed. What now? Vinny asked. Logan took a deep breath, then smirked to himself. I'm sticking around here for a while longer, get a look at their setup. When I come home, I'll lay out a plan. Short of formality, he ended the call. With the help of night vision binoculars, he scoped out the area. Logan knew police protocols. He welcomed the challenge and thrived on the adrenaline rush. It wasn't just a question of making the hit, then finding a safe egress. It was all about the thrill of the hunt, the fear of his prey. And given his recent canvassing of the neighborhood, he'd already begun to formulate a game plan. Taking Raven Mackenzie out of play was only a matter of time. Raven's eyes had grown accustomed to the dark. Even though her bedroom was nearly pitch black, the nightlight from the living room poured beneath her door, giving her comfort. A dim glow from an outside streetlight outlined the curtains, casting shadows into corners. All she had to do was close her eyes, but frustration got the better of her, manifesting in a heavy sigh. Throwing the comforter off, she got out of bed and made her way toward the large window in her bedroom. Clad only in a large CPD tee, she pulled back the drapery and stared into the void. Immediately, her eyes trailed to the heavens, their attention stolen by the brilliant moon. Nearer the horizon, the lights of the city robbed the sky of its own brilliance, their beauty obscured by man's cheap imitation. Outside her window, the hiss of brittle winter grass crunched underfoot. Her body reacted to the implied threat. Raven peered through the darkness, careful not to jostle the drapes. Her eyes darted across the backyard. She held her breath, ruling out every familiar sound from in and around her old house, listening for the exception. Just then, a shadow moved to her right. She remembered what Sam had told her earlier. Just in case you hear any noises outside, I'm going to have our guys take regular walks around the perimeter. She breathed a sigh of relief when the shape became clearer. The shadow was one of her watchdogs. Leaning against the window frame, she rolled her eyes and shook her head. Heaving a breath, she expelled tension from her lungs. The earlier home invasion had spooked her more than she realized. She closed her eyes, calming her heart. She was a prisoner in her own home. Resentment colored her attitude until her thoughts turned to Christian. She wondered what he was doing this very second. Outside the city, at the Dunhill estate, the night sky would be glorious. Perhaps one day, when the nightmare of this ordeal was over, they'd share its beauty. The hope of that moment soothed her beyond measure. Christian spent the afternoon digging through Fiona's life. Her delicate perfume still in the air, it reminded him of her absence. He'd grown melancholy with the futility of his effort. Searching the study and her bedroom took longer than he'd expected. Tomorrow he'd tackle the attic, not knowing what he'd find there. 
Hours ago, darkness had crept across the bedroom in lengthening shadows, forcing him to flip on several of the lamps nearby. He'd become so engrossed he hadn't been affected by the gloom closing in. Any other day, the impending darkness would have captured his attention like holding a snarling beast at bay. But today he was on a mission. Letters faded with age and old photographs lay cluttered across the carpet of Fiona's bedroom. Sitting cross-legged in the midst of it all, Christian realized he knew so little about her. Many of the mementos he'd never seen before. But then again, he'd been so defined by the violence in his life, he hadn't reached out to Fiona except to eventually take the lifeline she offered. Her life was more of a mystery than he cared to admit. And something peculiar troubled him. No newborn baby pictures. Gaps existed in his early life. Some of that could be explained away. His childhood had not been normal. For the most part, his mind was a blank slate. Post-traumatic stress had destroyed much of his memory. The one constant in his life since that tragic day had been Fiona. And now he felt like such a voyeur delving into her past. But he was certain the answers would be there if he only knew where to look, or perhaps how to look. Slowly, he reached for a photo of Fiona and Charles, flipping it over. One word was written across the back, along with a date. Honeymoon. He recognized Fiona's script. Something in the photo gnawed at him. His eyes had been drawn to the image several times during the course of his search yet he couldn't put his finger on the reason for this. Dressed in summer attire, the honeymooners squinted into the bright sun, standing at a harbor dock. Charles was beaming, his arm around the beautiful woman he'd married, and a young Fiona graced the scene, barely out of her teens. On the surface, an idyllic moment captured by the photographer. Then it struck him. Fiona wasn't smiling, and her body language showed tension. It was etched in her face. In contrast to her young husband, who clung to her like a prize, she showed no such affection. The single-word description on the back was purposefully written, without embellishment. Not even the location had been given, so contrary to what a newlywed might have done. Sifting through other photos, he began to see a pattern. Why hadn't he noticed it before? Christian knew the woman well enough to grasp it. Fiona hadn't loved Charles. And the years hadn't improved their relationship, chronicled in the many pictures spread before him. A discernible pattern. Why, Fiona, why did you marry a guy you didn't love? He muttered. It didn't make any sense, given the strength of the woman he'd grown to love. He couldn't imagine her being coerced into a loveless bond. As he picked up the honeymoon photo once again, another thought roused him from out of the blue. Something Raven had asked him at the armory. Can you think of any place else that Mickey might have kept some kind of locker? I found a key. Raven's voice teased his memory. An image popped into his mind. Now Christian knew where to look for the answer. But tomorrow would be soon enough. The tension and stress of the day invaded every sinew. Standing, he stretched the muscles of his back. His stomach growled in emptiness, but he was too restless to indulge it. He wandered to the French doors and on to the balcony off Fiona's bedroom. After sucking in the chilly night air, he exhaled a warm breath in a vapor trail. In no time, the cold absorbed into his shirt, chilling his skin with every brush of the fabric. The sensation invigorated him, clearing the fog from his brain. With only the dim radiance from Fiona's room shining through white window shears, the grounds of the estate were cast in a bluish haze, charged by the moon's energy. Shining brightly, the moon loomed overhead, growing larger by his estimation. The night sky, cloudless, 
it proudly displayed its dazzle. He felt small and insignificant. Yet despite the beauty above, his thoughts of Raven moved him far more. The woman had burrowed deep under his skin, never allowing him to forget her. Her beguiling infiltration had been subtle, with a rare sensuality. But the self-inflicted wound, named Raven Mackenzie, had not been without pain. With every remembrance, Christian felt just how lonely he'd allowed his life to become, and the thought that he could lose her made his stomach churn. Given the firepower of the attack launched against her partner, Christian feared for her safety. By all reports, her partner's home had been annihilated. By turning down his offer of protection, Raven was in denial about her ability to defend against such an assault. Her modest home would be indefensible, yet if he was being truthful, he'd have to confess his attraction to her stirred him more than he cared to admit. Damn it! Why had everything gotten so... complicated? Her dark eyes haunted him. Still, he contemplated betraying Raven's trust for Fiona's sake. Tomorrow he'd investigate on his own, looking for the secret that Mickey might have kept under lock and key, but depending upon what he found, he'd have a decision to make. Would he share it with Raven? Chapter 11 The details of the Blair file blurred on the page as she searched for anything she might have missed. Her ability to focus had waned, and it was only mid-morning. She hadn't slept well. Raven pinched the bridge of her nose and shut her eyes. When she opened them again, she caught sight of Tony's clip-on tie tossed on his desk. The image left her hollow. Now her eyes trailed to his empty chair, her misery complete. A distinct chill lingered in the room. She couldn't shake it. Despite being dressed in jeans with layers under a black cable-knit sweater, she still found her skin prickled in goosebumps. No amount of layering or rounds of hot coffee fended off the cold. Did one of you guys turn down the thermostat again? Normally, the question would have generated profuse finger-pointing and offers on ways to stay warm, but not today. All she got was polite smiles and a few shrugs. And the clock on the wall ticked away at an interminably slow pace. The world hadn't stopped altogether. Tony's absence loomed like a dark cloud in the bullpen. Out of respect, her fellow officers were uncharacteristically quiet. Their sideways glances and sympathetic expressions reflected their concern. Every time her phone rang, their eyes shifted nervously her way. She knew they wondered if the call meant news from the hospital. The calm made her anxious. Even her cub's cap, turned around rally style, hadn't provided any comfort. Feeling like a fleshy chunk of her had been carved out, she ached for her missing partner. Her early morning visit with Yolanda at the hospital hadn't remedied her concern. He'd had a bad night. Tony still wasn't out of the woods. But a familiar face drew her back into focus, warming her soul. Hey, honey, got any coffee for the old man? I could use a whole pot and a very large syringe. Lieutenant Sam Winters held a cardboard box in his arms, grinning ear to ear. Hey, LT, thought you'd be sleeping, she teased, glad for the distraction. Got to thinking about your daddy's old cases. Been searching through the archives after I got off shift. He set down his burden on Tony's desk. Care for a temporary partner for today while yours is on the mend? Sam spoke as if Tony had a bad case of the flu. Somehow his denial reassured her, like everything would be all right. I'll get you that coffee, but the preferred method of dosing around here is styrofoam. The syringe is up to you. By the time she returned from the break room, he had settled into Tony's desk, laying manila folders in piles. Figured I'd go through these, set aside any that stick in my brain as possibles. I got your old man's case notes. You ever looked at them? he asked. He handed her a black spiral notebook. Her father had kept them by year. Your daddy was the best cop I ever worked with. 
I still miss him. Good partners are like that. She fought the lump in her throat. Her hands reverently brushed the top of a bound notepad. She knew looking into his old cases would take time, but the malicious act of the bastard who'd invaded her home and destroyed her father's photo provided insight into the man's egotistical nature, and she was determined to capitalize on his mistake. This is going to be a long shot, Sam. Yeah, but when you're a Cubs fan, he replied with a crooked grin, setting her up. In unison, she joined him in one of her father's old sayings. Long shots are what we do. The waterfront off Lakeshore Drive glistened in the sun like a jeweler's case. The dazzle caught Christian's eye as he neared the Chicago Yacht Club. Boat masts normally speared the sky, but were noticeably absent. The vessels had been pulled from the lake and dry docked for winter. Set near the Chicago Loop, amidst a myriad of cultural offerings, the yacht club was a focal point to many sporting activities and home to Lake Michigan's finest regattas. Even with the change in season, the dock drew people to the waterfront and its adjacent trail system. Nature's tranquility was a magnet. Compared to the hustle of downtown, the harbor reflected serenity, an oasis from a more hectic pace. Christian turned his SUV into the Monroe Street parking garage, then walked across Lakeshore Drive toward the two-story Monroe Harbor Clubhouse and the sign indicating the marina office. Seeing the harbor in the photo of Fiona's honeymoon had jogged his memory. At one time, he had heard that Mickey owned a boat and kept it in a slip at the yacht club. Perhaps the man still had a connection to the posh facility. As Christian neared the water's edge, a breeze humbled him, coming through his khaki cargo pants. The bright sun held little warmth. Winter heralded its arrival with the wind off the lake. He zipped the front of his leather bomber jacket, covering his ivory cardigan. His hiking boots echoed his approach along the wooden pier. Just as he remembered, a set of glass doors revealed the location of lockers near the guest shower facility. Although the area was open now, instructions printed on the door laid out the hours for the secured card key access. Then his eyes found one security camera and another. His training made him a creature of habit. The upscale facility would have suited Mickey's taste. Raven's mystery key might have a home after all. Still, he hadn't decided if he would share whatever news he might find with her. The thought sent a pang of guilt jabbing at his conscience. He followed the walkway past the office, his eyes drawn beyond the shoreline. Without the narrow building to break the sporadic gusts, the chilly breeze stole his breath as he rounded the corner, tousling his hair and the untainted smell of the lake carried on the wind, beckoning like a haunting siren's call. The irresistible view drew him to the railing, his hands stuffed into his jacket. Even under dark glasses, his eyes watered with the cold. The expanse of water churned, mesmerizing him with its swells. Thoughts of raven crept into his mind. Surely such beauty was meant for two— She's like a mistress you can never forget. A man's voice interrupted his thought. Excuse me? Christian turned to see an older man standing farther down the wooden pier. It took him a moment to realize the stranger had been talking about the appeal of Lake Michigan. The man was dressed in layers. His gray hair peeked out from under a navy wool hat pulled over his ears, his bulbous nose red with the cold. The sparkle of the lake had been captured in his engaging eyes, despite the man's age. The lake. She's kept me coming here like an addiction. The old man's voice fit him, raspy and gnarled like his weathered skin. You visiting? I haven't seen you here before. Christian didn't offer a reply. A faint smile curved a corner of his mouth. He treasured his anonymity far too much to reveal anything to this stranger. Have a good one, mister. Enjoy your day. Turning, he walked back toward the office and left the old gent. Time to move on. Down from the lockers, another set of glass doors under an awning led to the small marina office. 
Once inside, he slipped off his sunglasses, his eyes adjusting to the darker interior. An unrecognizable melody wafted from overhead speakers. The walls were covered with dark wood veneer and cork message boards. Sitting between a sofa and armchairs, an evergreen shrub had seen better days. Beyond the vacant counter, a small office with metal filing cabinets was abandoned. No one manned the desk. Just then, the door behind him opened, and the old man from the wharf entered, sporting a grin on his face. "'What can I do for you, young man? Folks consider me Father Confessor round here. Talk to me. You'll find I'm a good listener.' Christian returned his smile, sharing his subtle brand of humor. "'Yes, sir. And I just bet they'd be right.' "'Was wondering if you could tell me if Mickey Blair still leases a boat slip here, or maybe has a locker. "'He hoped no other information would be asked of him. "'The man stepped behind the counter. The humor faded from his lined face. "'That information is generally considered private, mister. Did you know him?' "'Not well,' he cautiously replied. "'Christian narrowed his eyes and cocked his head to one side.' Couldn't help but notice you used the past tense. You hear what happened to Mick? Christian followed his instincts. As long as he kept him talking, the man might eventually cooperate. The trick was to get more information than he had to shell out. Man's gotta keep up with things, right? Aged eyes held Christian's stare. Guy's dead, anyways. Couldn't hurt just talking. He used to keep a boat here, the Freelancer, but he gave that up earlier this year, said he was going someplace warmer. No doubt. If there was a hell, Christian suspected Mick felt plenty of heat now. Mickey would have been as secretive about himself as Christian was, but somehow this man had kept an eye on him and had gotten him to talk. Interesting. And the guy continued to amaze him. And as for a locker, he still has it until the end of the year. Membership has its privilege. But I guess you could say Mr. Blair expired before his locker did. The man's abrupt chuckle filled the room. Anyway, I saw him down at the docks from time to time, carrying a duffel bag like he still had business here. Have you told the police about his locker? Nope. Figured I'd get around to it sooner or later. What are they going to find in a locker, anyway? Some old sneakers and a snorkel? Besides, I'm not the kind of guy that would stick his nose in other people's business. Christian fought to keep a smile from his face. I don't know. You look like a man that keeps up with the goings-on around here. Don't suppose you could tell me which of these lockers is his? Christian reached into his jacket pocket, pulling out his wallet. Thumbing through the bills, he waited for, Yeah, I've always been real good with numbers. The man smiled and gave a wink, hand outstretched. And, mister, a man could always use a new friend. What did you say your name was? Ulysses S. Grant. Christian smiled, handing over a fifty-dollar bill. You don't say. What's the S stand for? You get me into that locker, and S will stand for satisfied. The old man's laughter sealed their arrangement, but the image of Raven's dark eyes kept Christian from enjoying his small victory. With a bite missing, a chili cheese dog loaded with onions sat atop Raven's desk alongside a mound of untouched fries. The smell hovered in the air like a living, breathing thing. Sam's choice of lunch had no appeal. In contrast, the man was finishing the last bite of his footlong like he'd never get another. You gonna eat the rest? He raised both eyebrows, waiting for her answer. Once again, Raven looked up from her father's case notes, smiling when Sam's face reminded her of a big yellow lab she had as a kid. With your schedule, you better keep up your strength. Go ahead, LT. Thanks, baby girl. After taking a mouthful, he kept talking. I got a handful of cases here we can talk about. 
everything from a scumbag that killed his pregnant wife with a hunting knife to a DUI that got nasty. Where do you want to start? His voice buzzed her ear, not fully sinking in. A note in one of her father's cases unexpectedly caught her eye. What, Sam? Sorry, I was just reading. You got something? I don't really know. Her voice trailed off into a whisper, her eyes engrossed in her father's handwriting. Just a car theft. Some teenager. But Dad sure seemed agitated by the guy. He even makes a personal note here. What did he write? Just three words, printed and underlined in the margin, gray, dead eyes. Most of his work deals in the facts of each case, but this is different. Do you remember this one, Sam? Raven handed over the black notebook, open to an entry dated two years before the death of her father. With one glance at the name of the car thief, he focused his attention to the stack of manila folders to his left. Hadn't gotten to that pile yet. With a grin, he found what he was looking for. Yep, here it is. Logan McBride. Quietly, he read through the material, narrowing his eyes with concern. I remember this loser, a young punk with heaps of attitude. He looked up, tossing her the file. Raven knew what her father had seen in the man. His black and white booking photo was chilling. Defiantly, gray dead eyes stared back at her, without an ounce of contrition or fear. Logan McBride, she whispered to herself, trying to imagine the confrontation between her father and this man. She committed the face to memory. Sam spoke, bringing her back to the present. Looks like we got plenty of possibles. Let me give you the rundown so far, then we can make our top ten hit parade. Sound like a plan? Before she could answer, her phone rang. Raising an index finger to Sam, she picked up her line. Mackenzie? Raven, it's Christian. We've got to talk. You sure this is going to be okay? Maybe we can find someplace else. Given the look of concern on Christian's face, Raven had only one option for a reply. She lied. Yeah, this is fine. I love hot dogs. Having a serious case of déjà vu, she didn't have the heart to refuse his choice of pseudo-cuisine. It was the only food readily available this late in the afternoon. By the time she'd finished with Sam's case rundown, the lunch hour was long gone. Just her luck. Hunger had come back with a vengeance. After Christian heard her stomach growl at the station house, she lied about not having eaten, hoping he'd pick a quiet bistro. His only suggestion, a deliberate one, was a walk toward the yacht club. Now she held a mystery meat popsicle in her hand, minus the stick and wrapped in foil. No amount of yellow mustard and relish could hide it. The only thing that made it palatable was the view and the man walking by her side. Lake Michigan looked breathtaking, glistening in the afternoon sun. As they meandered back toward the waterfront, she filled her lungs with fresh air and nibbled at her slice of Americana in a bun. But she did a double-take when she glanced over to Christian. He was suspiciously eyeing his hot dog, avoiding his first bite. No doubt he'd chosen the red and white striped hot dog stand more for expediency than for the culinary wizardry of the vendor. "'Why'd you bring me here, Delacorte?' She raised an eyebrow. "'You on a first-name basis with the Mater D?' She found humor in her own remark, but he appeared distracted, avoiding her stare. Instead, he dodged her question by taking a bite of his dog. By the look on his face, it had been a bad choice. Forcing it down with a swig of bottled water, he finally replied, "'Was just wondering if you had a chance to dig up the old Dunhill files. I've come up against a brick wall on my end. Got nothing so far.' This close to the dock, Raven got the distinct impression he was fishing. She wasn't about to take the bait so easily. Those old files are archived, Christian, but I'm getting them delivered this afternoon, as soon as they've been located. She eyed him surreptitiously, observing every nuance of the man. 
he was even more difficult to read under dark glasses. Not sure I've decided to share them yet. I haven't seen much in the way of good faith from you. She let the implication hang in the air. An ordinary person would have filled the void in conversation, unable to leave silence be. Christian was anything but ordinary. He reversed her ploy, being content with utter stillness. A chess match with the man would be quite the challenge. Fighting a smile, she found a quiet spot with a wooden bench and a beautiful view of the waterfront. He joined her without a word. After tossing his half-eaten meal in a nearby trash receptacle, he sipped at his water and waited. The standoff might have been comical, except Christian was so preoccupied. Something's wrong. What is it? She asked, setting aside her lunch. He deliberated a moment, then pulled off his sunglasses, tucking them into a jacket pocket. Without the buffer, his eyes commanded her attention, softening his doleful expression. I can't help worrying about you. Whoever killed Mickey has no regard for the authority of the police, and gunning your partner down in front of his whole neighborhood just emphasizes that point. Turning, he fixed his eyes on her and brushed back a strand of hair that had blown across her cheek. The Dunhill estate is a fortress. I want you to stay with me. Those eyes had the power to make her say yes to just about anything, but so much more was at stake than her personal feelings. I've got a job to do. You know that. Nothing's worth your life, Raven. Staring out across the water, he shared his tainted view of her career choice. What you do. It's all about dealing with destruction and loss. No, Christian, you don't understand. For me, this job is about putting things right. It's about justice. She leaned toward him, touching a finger to his jawline. Eventually, she drew him back. Yet by the look in his eyes, he still searched for an understanding. After all the savagery that you see day after day, doesn't it chip away from who you are? The effects must be permanent. How do you deal with that? She felt certain his thoughts no longer reflected his view of her job. The emotion in his words ran much deeper, centered on his own grief. She could identify with his sentiments. The death of her father had robbed her of the innocence of her teenage years. In many respects, they had so much in common. Her connection to him was undeniable. But the effects don't have to be terminal. At some point, you gotta let go. Move on. The loss of my father pales in comparison to your tragedy, but I do understand some of what you've gone through. Then understand this. He reached for her hand, enfolding it in his. You putting your life on the line. It's painful for me to watch. Please, I'm asking you to reconsider. She ached hearing his heartfelt plea. With anyone else, she might have dismissed the concern. But gazing into Christian's eyes, it was nearly impossible. Nearly. You and I both have to remain strong. Don't you want to know who's doing this? She squeezed his hand. Focusing on the facts of the case, maybe she could distract him from his apprehension for her personal safety. Somehow this is all connected to your past. We just got to find the key, that's all. She caught a flicker in his eye. Something she said must have hit the mark. You wanted a sign of good faith? With a pained expression, he jutted his chin down the pier, back toward the clubhouse. That key you found in Mick's office. It probably belongs to a locker in there. Ask the old man at the marina office. His words left her stunned. Then he stood, leaving her with her mouth open and squinting toward his silhouette, shielding her eyes with a hand. Wait, where are you going? He didn't answer, but his next comment shook her. Just let me know what ballistics has to say. As Christian turned his back, her mind grappled with her heart. The cop in her wondered how he knew what would be in the locker, suspecting he'd tampered with evidence. But the woman in her wanted to blindly trust him. He must have sensed her inner turmoil. 
He stopped, and with barely a glance over his shoulder, he spoke in a hushed tone. The old man was with me. He can tell you that I did nothing more than look in the bag. For once, she was thankful not to be under the scrutiny of his eyes. It gave her the courage to ask the question she'd had on her mind. She's gone, isn't she? Standing, her arms clutched across her chest, Raven held firm to her link with him. I've tried her cell number countless times. Fiona's left you to deal with this, hasn't she? No words were necessary. The betrayal in his eyes told her everything she needed to know. Lowering his head, he put on his dark glasses and walked away. She found herself hoping he'd stop and turn around. But that never happened. Christian had given her more than just a sign of good faith. He'd made himself vulnerable to her investigation. Well, I'll be damned, she whispered. By the time Raven got home, it was after dark. She flipped the light switch and elbowed her way through the kitchen door, carrying a large cardboard box. With a toe, she kicked the door closed behind her, then traipsed into the living room. After setting her burden on a coffee table, she shrugged out of her holster, placing her Glock beside the box. The weight of it lingered on her shoulder. Dim light from her kitchen bled into the small living room as she collapsed onto her sofa, feeling her exhaustion. A long night lay ahead. She planned to keep working, focusing on the archived box about the Dunhill assassination and a selection of her father's old case files. With so much at stake, her curiosity far outweighed fatigue. The shadows and the comfort of the sofa enticed her to close her eyes, taking a short mental holiday. It had been quite a day. Just as she nodded off, in that space between reality and dreams, a soft knock at her kitchen door woke her. Sluggishly, she rose off the couch and went to the door, taking a peek through the small window. With a grin, she tugged on the doorknob and gazed upon her partner for a day, still sporting his signature grin. "'Hey, Sam, come on in.' Stepping aside, she let her family friend through the door. On duty again? You gotta be one tired hombre. No, baby girl, not tonight. This old man is wrung out. Just came by to make sure you're settled in for the night. He stood near her kitchen table. His body language told her he wasn't going to stay long. By his changed expression, he was all business. Any word on that rifle you found? I don't expect to hear anything from ballistics until tomorrow. With any luck, the striations from the H and K will match the bullet retrieved from the body of Charles Dunhill. What? You don't have enough to do? You gotta reopen the old Dunhill case? That was a very splashy headliner some twenty-plus years ago, he teased. If you can pin this on Blair as the shooter, then you got a fresh lead. You might be able to trace who gave the order on the hit. Normally, the cop in her would have been thrilled by the discovery. Solving such a high-profile case wouldn't hurt her career, but she knew the implications. As with any murder, the investigation would start with the person having the most to gain from his death. That person was obvious. Fiona Dunhill had gained a great deal. Even if she had nothing to do with her husband's killing— the woman's public reputation would be sullied by the new inquiry, dredging up the ugly innuendos. A nightmare revisited. On the other hand, if she were guilty, the thought wrenched Raven's heart. Her duty would obligate her to build a case and arrest the woman. The courts would do the rest. If she and Christian had any hopes of a relationship, surely they'd be dashed now. How would they weather such a devastating storm, no matter what the outcome? She felt certain that Christian had been protecting Fiona, making his show of good faith in turning over the contents of the locker all the more astonishing. Why the sudden change of heart? So many questions bubbled to the surface. What's the matter, honey? I thought you'd be more excited. Oh, nothing, Sam— Guess I'm just tired, that's all. 
She rubbed her forehead, feeling a stress headache coming on. Well, that's my cue to leave. You got a big day tomorrow. Get some rest, honey girl. He yanked the door open, standing near the threshold. The troops are positioned outside like last night. As soon as I get some rest, I'll be back at it tomorrow. Maybe we can finish our talk about your daddy's old case files. Yeah, sounds good, LT. Standing on her toes, she gave him a quick peck on the cheek. His face reddened to the color of his hair. Thanks. Good night, darling. Don't spend the whole night reading. Getting your rest is important, too. He gently tapped a knuckle to her chin, then walked toward the street. From the shadows, she heard him say, I'll tell your watchdogs that you'll be up late. Locking the door behind him, she leaned against it, folding her arms across her chest. Her eyes found the cardboard boxes in her living room. Feelings of exhilaration and dread skirmished in her brain. No matter what she discovered, the foundation of Christian's life would be undermined. In that moment, she understood the courage it took for him to open his past to her. But the responsibility weighed heavy. I just hope you're not going to hate me when this is all over, she prayed, her voice a whisper. The beam of the flashlight strafed his position. He held his breath, willing himself not to react. At one point, the cop stared right at him. With nerves of steel, he remained calm, confident he wouldn't get caught. He melded into the shadows like a ghost. In such a quiet, unsuspecting neighborhood, the dark side of his nature took control, a predator among sheep. The cop finished his patrol, securing the perimeter of the small bungalow. He understood their routine, counted on it. They had no idea what to expect. He'd parked several blocks away and stuck to the shadows that deepened after two in the morning. He had a clear plan in his head with only one objective, to find Raven Mackenzie. Taking a risk, he left the cover of an evergreen shrub and prowled around the corner of the house, brazenly following the cop on patrol at a safe distance. Carefully tracking the beam of light, he waited until the uniform swept the far corner, then counted to five. Patience would be key. Now crouching by a brick wall at the back of the house, he held his breath. His eyes peered through the gloom. He forced his body to remain still, fused to the darkness. The wind bounced sounds through the night, playing tricks on his ears. But adrenaline galvanized him, tensing his body. He listened for any sound out of the ordinary, relying on his training. Even dressed in black, he knew part of him would be exposed to a stippling of pale light from a street lamp filtered through tree limbs. He had to make it quick. He lowered his body to the ground, flat on his belly, crawling toward the narrow basement window. Along the frame, no wiring connected to an alarm. One less thing to contend with. Propped on a shoulder, he clutched the handle of the suction clamp he'd brought with him. A gloved hand secured it to the glass. A faint hiss. Now the glass cutter scratched along the smooth surface a high-pitched grating sound. Seconds. He had only seconds to make the cut and slip inside if he wanted to remain undetected. Getting this close to the house spurred him on. The police protection had been no match for his skill. With a tug, the glass broke free, still connected to the metal clamp. He tossed the tools behind a bush. Sliding his hand inside, he released the window latch. In one fluid motion, he rolled through the opening and lowered his boots quietly to the floor. The basement smelled musty and dank, the chill of the night leaching through the cinderblock walls. His eyes adjusted to the dark, then located the stairs. He was close now. Soon he would have her in his sights. The thought churned his blood, fueling his excitement. With each step, Deliberate, he moved through the clutter of boxes and unused furniture, the obstacles only dimly lit from the narrow windows at his back. Arms outstretched, he felt his way up the wooden staircase, careful not to give his position away. 
If he was discovered now, he might lose his life to a bullet. But failure was not an option. At the top step, he turned the doorknob, then gingerly pushed it open. Slipping through the door, he placed his back to the wall, reconnoitering and assessing his plan. Down the hallway, a lamp burned. He listened intently, then crept forward. Using a mirror on the wall across from him, he peered into the small living room, careful to keep his face in the shadows. In the reflection, he found her. Raven Mackenzie lay on the sofa, a file folder spread across her chest. A Glock lay in its holster on a nearby table. Her head was turned away from him. Strands of hair had fallen away, exposing the pale skin of her neck. He waited to make sure she was sleeping. With mesmerizing steadiness, her breasts heaved, gently moving the papers in the manila folder. The intimacy of the act electrified him. Even though the front drapes were drawn, he didn't want to take the risk of moving in clear view with the lights on. From the front of the house, his large silhouette backlit by a living room lamp would be like sending up a flare. Before he went any further, he slid his gloved hand along the wall and doused the lights. From the street, it would look as if she'd gone to bed. The cops outside would have no reason to suspect anything out of the ordinary. The room plunged into darkness. It took his eyes a moment to adjust. Her silhouette was tinged in a faint glow from the window. Measured breaths told him she still slept. One careless mistake now would draw the posse in blue. But an even greater concern was the gun on the living room table. She could shoot him without a court in the world condemning her for the action. Careful not to wake her, he crept closer. All of his effort would come down to the next few seconds, and he wasn't about to back down now, not in his nature. Slowly, his hand reached for the gun, but his instincts stopped him. His eyes darted through the room, unsure what had triggered his reaction. Then he realized her breathing had changed. Too late. He'd lost his edge. A shrill alarm jarred his brain. Grab the gun! Chapter 12 Her eyes opened. At least she thought they were. Darkness deceived her, toyed with her perception. Black and white images of Charles Dunhill, with part of his skull missing, reminded her she had fallen asleep reading the old case file, a hazard of the trade. Now her warm breath touched her cheeks, deflecting off the back of the sofa. Her face burrowed against a pillow. Exhausted as she was, she couldn't force her body to move. Her limbs felt like lead. She lay there in the dark, content to waver in and out of sleep. But something jolted her out of a stupor. The room was dark. Who had turned out the lights? Shutting down her body's natural recoil, she listened intently, hoping she'd only overreacted. A faint sound. A presence weighed heavy in the room just behind her. Tensing her jaw, she resisted the urge to turn around. She assessed the situation, relying on her memory for the layout of the room. The chances of getting to her gun in time weren't good. One chance. She'd have one chance to get this right, and only one option remained. Without hesitation, she made her move. Raven was determined to kick some ass. Lunging off the sofa, she used its leverage to shove her body into the shadow of a man— her shoulder lowered like a linebacker's. She hit her target with all her strength. The intruder let out a painful groan and fell back against the wall, hitting hard. A gasp of air resounded as he sank to the floor. She'd knocked the wind from his lungs, but she prepared to do some real damage. Set on knocking him into next week, she escalated her assault. Propped against the wall, the man lay panting, trying to recover. With her legs straddling his, she pummeled his face with her fists, first the right, then the left. She'd have only a short time to get her licks in before he'd launch his counterattack. 
every strike felt like hitting a brick wall. Her knuckles were raw and ached with pain, compounded by a burning tingle in her shoulder. Adrenaline kept her arms pumping, inflicting as much damage as she could. Her face burned in outrage. Taking a moment to glance over her shoulder, she glimpsed the dark shape of her holster. The butt of her weapon was near the edge of the table. With no time to waste, she crawled toward it, slowed by the damage to her shoulder and hands. But she'd made a fatal miscalculation. The man had shaken off her beating and lunged, rolling her to one side, away from the gun. With all his weight, he pinned her to the floor, bracing his hands to her wrists. The lower half of his body fortified his dominance over her. Darkness closed in. She bucked and rocked to free herself. Bright flashes streaked across her eyes with the exertion. Think. She had to think. His face was too far away for a headbutt. Her only recourse now was to scream. Ah! A guttural sound escaped from deep inside her lungs, fueling her rage. Hey, don't. Stop it, he pleaded. I'm not going to hurt you. Had she heard right? As soon as she stopped thrashing, the man eased his grip of her hands. The darkness obscured his face, but the voice was... Damn, you pack a punch. I think you busted my lip. His voice. Are you okay? A part of her had been relieved, but an even larger part was mad as hell. Get off me, damn it! What the hell were you thinking? Christian didn't budge, his full weight upon her. I didn't want to read about you in the paper, knowing I could have done something. I had to make my point, and showing you was the only way to do that. You're not safe here. Those eyes, even in the dark, they found hers, and the deep baritone of his voice and the feel of his body, rock hard against her, sent chills along her flesh. His chest heaved with every breath, his skin radiating heat to match her own. The blood rushed to her cheeks, then pulsated to other parts of her. The sensation was intoxicating. She knew he felt the pull of attraction. The hunger in his eyes was undeniable, yet the awkwardness of the moment left few options. If I let you up, are you going to behave? It was the last thing she wanted, so she milked the moment. You bust into my house in the dead of night, and you're worried about my behavior? She challenged those eyes, then set her jaw. You let me up, and I might have to kick your ass all over again. Feeling a little cocky, are we? He shifted his weight, nearly driving her insane. As a matter of fact, she snickered. Nothing little about it, if my memory of the male anatomy serves. The low rumble of his laughter coerced a broad grin to her lips. She closed her eyes and enjoyed the sound. Slowly, he released his grip, letting her go. Sitting back on his haunches, then rising, he held out his hand to help her up. She gripped his strong fingers, feeling weightless as he lifted her from the floor. In the dark, she groped for the light switch, then flipped it on. Turning back, she tilted her chin and furrowed her brow, assessing the damage. I think I did bust your lip. Dressed in black military garb, Christian dominated her small living room with his athletic build. He towered over her, broad shoulders narrowing to slender hips and long legs. Only good timing and her surprise attack had brought him down— and then only for a brief moment. Still, she'd connected her blows. Blood from the cut on his lip painted his chin. She'd left her mark. With her reminder, he dabbed at his wound with a finger, drawing his tongue over the spot. You realize this was a very dumb idea. You could have gotten yourself killed. She crossed her arms, standing defiantly. I had to take the chance. His eyes held no apology. I didn't bring a weapon. If I had, you would have been dead. Her smile quickly faded. The truth of his words chilled her. And the men out there? I would have taken them out first. No one would have been able to help you, Raven. He was dead right. 
and he had been only one man. Tony had seen a small band of mercenaries with state-of-the-art weapons. The conspicuous squad cars and the police patrolling the grounds outside her house would have deterred the common criminal. But there was nothing common about this situation. Using her quiet neighborhood to stand her ground suddenly seemed foolish. So many innocent people were at risk. Reality hit her square in the face. But this is not your fight, Christian. Why should you take this on? Whoever this guy is, he sent a very clear message for me to seek the truth, and punctuated it with a dead body. And for whatever reason, he's drawn you into it, and Tony. He stepped closer, the intimacy of his voice commanding her senses. I am involved, even more than you. This is my fight. I've made it mine. And what about Fiona? I'm not so sure she'd want you aligning yourself with the police on this one. Her eyes drifted to the Dunhill files strewn on the floor, the autopsy photos and other evidence carelessly spread over her rug. At first he met her eyes, a stern resolve in his tone. I have to trust my instincts. I honestly don't know anything about this but I want to believe her. Then his voice wavered, and he couldn't hold her stare. Christian had his doubts. Maybe together they could sort through this mess. She had the old case file here. Pooling their resources, they might make some headway. Raven considered the option he offered, but with a glance down at her knuckles and a roll of her aching shoulder, she had things to do. She had to trust her instincts, too. I'm going to accept your offer, for now. How could I refuse such a persuasive invitation? She teased, wincing as she lightly touched a finger to his bruised lower lip. The Dunhill estate is so fortified, the bastard would have to be a fool to launch an attack against it. In response to her sympathetic touch, Christian torqued his jaw, making sure it worked. If he had a bruised ego, it wasn't showing. Let's get cleaned up. I gotta pack a few things, call off my police protection, and talk to some folks. With a sly glance over her shoulder, she smirked. You always go to so much trouble to get a woman to come home with you? Christian's smile broadened to a devilish grin. It's usually not this difficult. No. With a shake of her head, she laughed and tugged at his arm, leading him to her bathroom. I don't doubt it, Delacorte. I don't doubt that at all. In the hours before dawn, the Dunhill estate glowed on the horizon, its security light serving as a beacon. Before her, the ribbon of asphalt emerged from the darkness only as far as her headlights reached, winding through the shadowy terrain. Raven gripped her steering wheel and followed the red tail lights ahead. She knew Christian's plan made sense. Yet the idea of spending so much one-on-one -on -one time with him sent her stomach reeling. The thrill of expectancy and the uncertainty of cold feet vied for position. It would have been more comforting if she'd ridden with him so they could talk. But she'd been determined to have her independence and drive her own car. The massive stone wall with its wrought-iron gate loomed ahead. Several men in uniform bounded from the shadows, weapons drawn, surrounding both vehicles. In the lead, Christian spoke to a guard, then waved a hand back to her. The other men peered through the headlights into her vehicle, without a change in their stern expressions. With a curt nod, the guard standing closest to Christian's SUV waved her onto the property. He commanded the others to stand down and resume their duties. Part of her felt secure behind these gates, yet another part felt trapped and alone. She wondered if Christian ever felt that way. The old oaks lining the drive stood like sentinels, more ominous under the sweeping headlights than she remembered from her first visit. The imposing presence of the Dunhill mansion intimidated her, emerging even larger as she approached. Its size alone made her feel small and unimportant. With eyes on the grand front entry up ahead, she reminded herself to breathe. On her first visit, she'd been a cop with a job to do. It had been a distraction. 
but this time she'd have her cub's cap in hand, staying for a while. I hope they give out maps at the door, cause I can guarantee I'm gonna get lost in there, she whispered, the blue dash lights casting shadows on her hands and clothing. And what the hell am I going to do with a butler or a maid? How do you live like this, Delacourt? Humor didn't ease her worry. It only reminded her just how different her life was from Christian's. He'd practically grown up here, accustomed to such wealth and self-indulgence. Tony was right. I must come from a long line of raven lunatics. She chalked it up to raw nerves being a fish out of water. She wasn't sure what to expect from a man who'd been a total stranger just a short time ago. Correct that. A suspect. For crying out loud, the man had been a suspect. She rolled her eyes, chastising herself again. Doubts played serious havoc with her judgment. As Christian approached the circular drive leading to the front steps, he didn't slow his speed. It threw her. He bypassed the main house and drove around a bend. His tail lights disappeared. Where was he going? She knitted her brow and blindly followed his lead. As she made the turn to the right, a quaint cottage lay just ahead. Subtle landscape lighting gave it a gentle radiance, illuminating the encircling trees. Its charm reminded her of a Disney flick. She pulled in behind him and turned off the ignition to her car. So this is where you hang your hat, Delacourt. Very nice. She nodded her approval, craning her neck toward the windshield for a better view. Then it hit her. The pretentious mansion with its many, many rooms was one thing. But this? I'm going to be staying here with you in this small, intimate cottage. Oh, my God. The minute he opened his car door and turned to see her face, he realized something had changed in her resolve. For the first time since he'd met her, Raven looked unsettled, off her game. But then again, he knew exactly how she felt. His home had always been his oasis, a refuge. Despite his joking with her about bringing women home, he'd never brought one here. Tensing his jaw, he wondered why his mind drifted to something so personal. This is business, Delacourt. Yet with Raven, it felt like anything but... The evidence box hoisted to his shoulder, he turned the key to the front entry, then quickly entered a passcode into the security system to his right. With a sideways glance, he watched her walk past him and stop, setting her overnight bag beside her feet. I called ahead, had the housekeeper change the sheets and stock the kitchen. You take the bedroom. He set the evidence box in the study, then took a deep breath before heading back to her. Stepping back into the living room, he found her still standing near the entry. Her eyes absorbed every detail of her limited accommodations, without uttering a word since she'd crossed his threshold. He hadn't known her for very long. Even so, he knew Raven being speechless would be highly improbable. He took a risk, hoping to break the ice. I assure you, I can control my manly urges. You're safe here. Hand to his chest, he waited for a smile from her. None came. Instead, she slowly stepped into the living room. Her eyes darted to the room just beyond, his bedroom. Its double doors were open, its lamps lit and welcoming. And from what she could tell, the housekeeper had even left a chocolate mint on the pillow. Still, she avoided the bedroom with a vengeance. Tension dominated the space between them. He felt the need to defend his decision. An outsider's assumption is that you'd be staying in the mansion, and the smaller place makes it easier to defend. Is this arrangement a problem? She hesitated for only an instant. No, not at all. It's just that I don't want to take your bedroom. Let me. I'll sleep on the couch. It wasn't what he wanted to hear, but at least she was talking. No way. If it'll make you feel any better, I can barricade the doors once you're inside, block it with this console table, maybe that chair. She crossed her arms and eyed him suspiciously, her defiance back. 
The barricade would only work from the inside, Delacorte. Yeah, well, just seeing if you were paying attention. Her expression finally softened. He'd even coerced a soft chuckle from her. It gave him the courage to speak freely. Look, if it makes you feel any better, this is as awkward for me as it is for you. Contrary to what you might believe, I've never brought a woman here. Not here. This is my home. And I want to welcome you to it. Please relax. I want you to feel safe, especially from me. Raven smiled, and as she stepped slowly toward him, he found himself holding his breath. On occasion, truth has come from those lips, and I do trust you, Christian. I keep asking myself why, but I do trust you, she teased, placing her hands on his chest, a finger circling a button. He swallowed hard. Already his body reacted to her familiarity. With her standing so close, he wanted nothing more than to kiss her again, to feel her body next to his. But this was all about building trust between them. If anything more were to follow, it had to start on a foundation of trust. She'd have to make the first move. Having her here would be the combination punch of ecstasy and pure torture that only a woman inflicted upon a man, and he had the bruises to prove it. With his past in question, and his future an even bigger mystery, his truce with her would be difficult enough. He wasn't sure he had the strength to endure the sweet torment of Raven Mackenzie. She cleared out of his bedroom long enough for him to move some toiletries to the guest bath, retrieve a change of clothes for the morning, and take a quick shower. As she wandered into the library, she heard the shower start. Perusing his book collection would not keep her from imagining his firm body under a hot stream of water, but it would have to do. From the little she knew of him, his life focused on violence. He trained like a warrior, a result of his traumatic childhood, and armed men surrounded his home. All of it had comprised violence or his fear of it. Yet in this library, in his home— his struggle for serenity was so apparent. Classical music and literature, books of poetry abounded, leaving her all the more confused by this enigmatic man. Her fingers lightly trailed along the book spines, maintained with great care, on polished cherrywood bookshelves. This had to be his favorite room. It was hers, too. She pictured him reading by a crackling fire or working at the computer on his desk. And yes, he'd fight the urge to gaze out the window at the picturesque grounds with only the measured beat of a clock to keep him company. The image was so vivid, lonely, and comforting at the same time. Christian was definitely a man of contradictions. I left towels for you on the bed. His low voice melded into her mind like an afterthought. Sleep in tomorrow morning if you'd like. She turned to find him standing barefoot by the study door. His dark waves still damp from the shower, he was dressed in a black T-shirt and jeans. A pale blue towel draped his neck. As she stepped closer, the faint scent of herbs mixed with the unique essence of his skin, teasing her senses. The color of the towel tinted his green eyes to a familiar deep azure, making it nearly impossible for her to walk by him. But the cop in her took over, reminding her she was here for a reason. A killer was free. The bastard had nearly killed Tony and had invaded her home, forcing her from it. Damn. Reality bites. Good night, Christian. Sleep well. She resisted the urge to touch him as she walked by, clenching her fingers into a fist. But one urge she couldn't fight was the impulse to fill her lungs with his scent. Why did he have to smell so good? It was a very long walk across the living room. Before she closed the bedroom doors, she looked for him one last time. He stood at the threshold of the library, his arms folded across his ample chest, and those eyes held her just as sure as if she were in his arms. Her breath wavered, catching in her throat. Normally, a polite smile from her would have severed the connection between them, allowing her to carry on. 
but her attraction for him had been undeniable from the start. Now the hunger was impossible to ignore. After shutting the doors behind her, she leaned against them and closed her eyes to capture the memory. Her whisper broke the spell. You've crossed the line, woman. You've leapt over it and thumbed your nose. There's no going back now. Chapter 13 Nicholas disapproved of the music selection off his home stereo system. This morning, the classical piece felt far too grim for his mood. But it was better than the alternative. Dead silence gave him too much time to think. His fork scraped the gold-trimmed china as he cut into his last bite of pastry. The noise resounded hollowly across the formal dining room, competing with the crackle of a small fire in the hearth and the faint strains of an orchestra. The emptiness reminded him of the solitary nature of his life. His gaze dropped to the newsprint, scanning the morning headlines for any distraction. Nothing piqued his interest. He poured himself another cup of coffee and sat back in his chair. His gaze drifted to the crystal chandelier overhead. He found the rainbow prisms quite mesmerizing in this light. Then the crass noise of his cell phone drew him from his self-pity. He recognized the number. Good morning, sweet mantis. He welcomed the intrusion. Where are you, my dear? I find myself a mere three blocks from the gates of hell. But rest assured, Nicky, I'm never so far from civilization that I cannot find a Starbucks. A smile spread over his face as he pictured his bodyguard. Her propensity for understatement and dry wit was always a source of amusement. He had ordered her to follow Logan McBride, keeping track of his whereabouts. As he read the morning paper, catching up on the news of the world, Jasmine had called to bid him tidings from its seedy underbelly. Leave it to you to find the light at the end of the tunnel to be a mocha frappuccino. What word from our little zoo menagerie? Our vicious hyena is curled in his lair, but as you expected, he did make another reconnaissance run early this morning. And he wasn't alone this time. I think he had planned an unexpected party. Needless to say, he was not pleased to find the nest of the raven abandoned. Abandoned? How so? My resources were divided at the time. The uniforms were noticeably absent. But I will find out where the bird has flown if you order it. He sipped his coffee, pondering his next move. Yes, I'm curious. See what you can find out. But first, locate a suitable replacement and get some rest. I have a feeling our beast will soon be more frenzied in his hunt. What is your opinion, Mantis? A very astute observation. I would agree. Should I put him out of his misery? You only have to give the command. This is developing into an interesting standoff. The timing could prove to be most entertaining. He stood, brushing off his dark gray suit with his linen napkin. Walking to a window, he gazed upon the drab day, a true reflection of his disposition. My contacts abroad have informed me that my recent trip to Paris had some effect. And if I had to guess, I'd say guilt will soon be winging her home. Silence. It took Jasmine a moment to respond. Are you okay, Nikki? The beautiful woman was most perceptive. I can end it now. Just give the word. He considered her words, then responded, failing miserably to keep the melancholy from his voice. There is still time, Mantis. I'm not ready for such finality. As you've said before, it shall not be difficult to lay the blame at the feet of the dearly departed hyena. Not so dearly departed from my perspective, but I shall respect your wishes. I will see you shortly. And I will be waiting. He ended the call. 
He knew Jasmine perceived a change in him whenever he talked about Paris. She allowed him to keep his distance on the subject of Fiona, even though he suspected his bodyguard knew more than she let on. He confided so much in her, but not about this. His pride and his disdain for vulnerability would not allow it. After a quick breakfast, Raven set up a work area in the study, spreading the case files over a table near the fireplace. A steady flame burned atop a bed of white ash, with orange embers glowing through the pyre. Finally, looking up from her work, she gazed toward the windows. Through the shears, the gray morning must have dispersed, leaving a sunny day without much notice from her. The work had been tedious. Burrowed into the corner of an oversized black leather sofa, she tucked the edge of a comforter under her legs, an ankle resting on Christian's thigh. Earlier, she had ventured the bold move, forgetting herself. Once she realized what she had done, the intimacy of the act sent chills across her skin. But he took it all in stride, only sharing a faint smile and a steamy glance from those bedroom eyes. Now he intently studied a file as he sipped from a coffee mug. She winced when she spotted the bruise on his lip, then fought to hide her smile at the memory of last night. After a while, he broke the comfortable silence between them. So, if I'm reading this report correctly, the investigation on Fiona came to an end without any link found to the murder of her husband. According to this, her phone and bank records were clean. He thumbed through the last pages of a detective's findings, his eyes searching the details. No indictment. At the time, yes, but I've started a new search on Mickey's past. We've already instigated a look into his phone records and banking information. We'll be looking for any frequently dialed phone numbers or deposits of any significant size. If there's a connection to Fiona or anyone who might have given the order, it may still turn up. She saw defeat in his eyes. It's standard operating procedure for an investigator to look at the person who had the most to gain by the victim's death. I'm exploring all my options. That's all. I know, but Mickey could have worked for someone else, even if he was the shooter, right? Yes, but keep in mind that he got his security job at Dunhill shortly after the killing. That's too much coincidence, Christian. She knew he would be grasping at straws, looking out for Fiona's interests. I know this is difficult for you. We're going to be opening up some very old wounds. Can you handle it? His eyes fixed upon her, letting the silence fill the void. Then, in a soft voice, he began. Fiona gave me a home when I had no one. I would have been a ward of the state if she hadn't intervened. To this day, I don't know why she did it. You were a young boy needing help, and she had the resources. Still, it was very generous of her. But why you, Christian? Did you have any other connection to her? No. She said she took pity on me from reading the story in the newspaper. He shook his head, a sad smile on his face. I was a real basket case. The fear, the anger. I fought her every step of the way, like it was all her fault. But she never backed away. She waited for me to reach out to her. Raven's cell phone vibrated on her belt. The timing couldn't have been worse. Mackenzie, the voice of CSI Scott Farrell recited his findings on the ballistics test conducted on the sniper rifle found at the marina locker. It looked as if Christian were holding his breath until she finished the call. The ballistics report came back positive. The striations matched the bullet retrieved from the body of Charles Dunhill, and Blair's prints were the only ones found on the rifle. Pretty good indication that Mickey was the shooter. He swallowed hard as he digested the new information, clutching the file on his lap. I just want you to understand that I owe her everything, and she's not the kind of woman that would kill her own husband. Don't get me wrong; she's one of the strongest women I know, but to kill for money, it's not possible. But she might kill for another reason. At first, her suggestion that Fiona could kill for any motive looked like it surprised him. The shock of it registered in his eyes, yet his silence told her all she needed to know. Fiona Dunhill was indeed a strong woman, but what would force her to condone murder as a necessary evil? 
and the cop in her was plagued by another piece of the puzzle. It still bothers me that the killer staged the old armory, suggesting there's a tie to the death of your family and the murder of Dunhill. Have you thought about the link? He shook his head, pulling a hand through his dark waves in frustration. That's been bugging me too. I was always told police had a hand in the killings, some kind of botched police raid on the wrong house, but no charges were ever filed. Any way for you to check that out? I've blocked so much from my memory. I've got an old family friend checking on that one. He was a partner to my father. Sam's got a pretty long memory. Maybe something will turn up. Christian's sad gaze drifted toward the crackling fire. His mind clearly rooted in his past. With his chin resting on the back of his hand, his expression grew more solemn. What's the matter? Did you think of something? She prodded. After a long moment of silence, he finally confided in her. You are right about Fiona being gone, and it's not like her to run from a fight. The fire flickered in his eyes. I just found out how little I know about her. I've been so wrapped up in my own misery, I forgot how much she's done for me. Coaxed by his words, she turned her thoughts to the memory of her father. He had made parenting look effortless. At least that's how she chose to remember him. As a bulletproof teen, she believed he would be with her forever. Now all that remained was the foundation of love he'd built for her. No matter how all this turns out, Christian, it's important that you always remember that. It was all she could say to comfort him. Vinnie stepped quietly up the stairs, then knocked on Logan's bedroom door. The heavy tray in his hands carried the man's dinner. If everything wasn't perfect, Logan would unleash on him. These days, it didn't take much to set him off. Come in. The muffled directive finally came. I thought you might like some dinner. Vinnie walked across the room to set the tray down on a table. The smell of sex mingled with another scent he knew well. Blood stained the sheets, confirming his suspicions that Kruger's woman had borne the brunt of Logan's hostility. Hoping she'd weather the storm, he had sent her to the master suite to appease Logan after the disappointing trip to the pretty detective's house. Now her clothes were strewn about the room, stripped from her in his apparent frenzy. She lay naked beneath the stained sheets of the man's bed, bruised and bloodied. Her tears signaled her complete surrender. If you're done, I can feed her downstairs. Let you have your privacy, he offered. Logan stared at him, his expression unreadable. Vinnie swallowed hard, finding it difficult to suppress his ragged breath. Or can I interest you in another diversion? Whatever you like, sir. There's only one sport that interests me, Vin. Rage surged, coloring the man's skin. Nothing pisses me off more than a botched mission. You know that. Vinnie saw his fury as clearly as if the man were a kettle on a stovetop, on the brink of boiling over. He'd seen it before, at the detective's house. Logan tore the place apart after he'd found the woman packed and gone, the police cruisers nowhere in sight. But just as quickly as the anger swelled, it subsided with Logan's insane laughter. The man's mood swings were getting worse. His amusement only twitched Vinnie's flesh, and the woman at Logan's side clutched the bedsheet to her bare breasts, cowering from his twisted brand of humor. I think I know just how to jumpstart this hunt, and that bitch won't be able to refuse. She's gonna give herself to me, Vinnie. Just like all women do, eventually. He stroked the head of the woman lying next to him. Cruelty dominated his eyes. With the tip of his tongue, he licked the blood from the corner of her mouth, savoring its taste. I think a little divine intervention is in order. With a relieved smirk, Vinny waited for his orders. During their simple dinner of sandwiches, Christian found himself telling Raven about an area of the mansion that he'd yet to explore. 
He had nearly forgotten about it until she prompted his memory, delving into Fiona's past. Now he shoved the east wing attic door open, getting his bearings with a flashlight. The air felt thick with the smell of dust. He flipped the light switch. Only on rare occasions had he been in this particular storage space, and only when accompanied by Fiona herself. Without her, he felt like such an interloper into her past. Cardboard boxes, a rack of old clothes wrapped in plastic, and a couple of wooden trunks marginally filled the space. I hope you're not allergic to dust. The air is a little stale, he warned. Once he determined the layout, he lowered his hand to his guest, steadying her as she took the last step up the ladder. This place is larger than my whole house. Raven stood beside him. Her eyes peered through the pale light. But considering some of the things I've got in my attic, she's not much of a pack rat. She told me once that these were the things she couldn't part with. Too many memories. Raven wandered to the clothes rack. Hey, put that flashlight to good use. Shed some light on these clothes. She slid the hangers apart for a better view once he directed the beam of light. God, she was a tiny little thing. Check out the size of this dress. Holding up a white beaded evening gown, she wedged the wooden hanger under her chin. The only time I could have fit into this was when I was a teenager. I bet you'd look amazing in an evening gown. He smiled. Even in this light, he knew she blushed. Normally, the dark space would have raised his blood pressure, but with Raven along, he felt comfortable. Do you think they make a thigh holster for my Glock, one that wouldn't break the line of this gown? Just another makeover challenge, I suppose. She opened the clasp of the beaded bag that had been stored with the gown. Oh, look, this evening bag still has a ticket stub for. Can I have the light, please? She grasped the flashlight he handed her, then squinted to read the small print. La Bohème. And judging by the date on this, she'd been a teenager. Wow, must have been some performance. The attic is like one big album of memories. Once again, Christian realized how little he knew the woman who'd saved his life from the ruin it might have become. Raven helped him sift through the boxes and trunks, opening one after the other. With every revelation, he became more reticent, letting her fill the gap in conversation. Hey, Christian, this one is locked. You have a key? Maybe it's just stuck. She tugged at the lid without success. Here, let me try this. In his hand, he held an old metal shoehorn that he'd found. Raven directed the light over his shoulder as he wedged the piece of metal between the trunk and its lock. After a couple of attempts, he eventually pried it open. Propping the lid against the wall, he gazed inside. His hands leafed through old papers and photographs until, oh my God! He exclaimed, "What the hell is this?" Father Antonio neared the end of his time in the confessional. It had passed quickly, considering this was his first day back after administrative leave. The archdiocese had offered him relief from his regular duties, but the idle time only made him remember. It felt good to be a contributing member of this community once again. Between parishioners partaking of his service, he distracted himself with the rosary in his hand, to ensure the anonymity of his congregation. Only a small night light lit the inside of his compartment. Accustomed to the dark, he relied on his sense of touch, rolling the smooth black beads between his fingers. His whispered prayers kept the deathly grimace of Mickey Blair at bay. It gave him strength to know that in the small space of the confessional, God kept him company. Pulling him back to his duties, the confessional door opened. He heard the creak of wood as the member of his flock genuflected. After putting the rosary beads in the pocket of his vestments, he slid the screen open. Allowing him to see only a man's faint silhouette kneeling in the booth next to him, the man didn't speak. His face was a blur, covered in shadow. He waited, permitting the man time to gather his thoughts. Still nothing. Can I help you? 
Is there something you'd like to confess? He turned his head and focused on the blackened image. In the pale light, he made out the side of the man's face. To his surprise, he was grinning. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, he made an assumption about the man's reaction. There is no need to be ashamed. In the eyes of God, you are his child. Don't be afraid to ask his forgiveness. God would never claim me as his own. Trust me. The voice was a raspy whisper, a low guttural sound. And I don't need or want his forgiveness, Father Antonio. Then why are you here? The priest stiffened his back and pulled away. Something wasn't right. And how do you know my name? I came here looking for you, Father. You see, I'm in need of a little divine intervention, and only you can help. So I made it a point to find out who you are from one of your parishioners. The man's voice was chilling. How had he missed it before? If you aren't here to confess, then I'm afraid my time here is done. He stood and reached for the door. It wouldn't budge. He turned the knob, but it wouldn't open. He shoved, putting his shoulder into it this time. It jarred open an inch, then shut again with a slam. Someone rammed it back, pinning him inside. What was going on? Please, I don't understand, he begged. You're right, father. I'm not here to confess, and your time here is done. The man laughed softly. Come with us quietly, or we'll start shooting. I don't think God would care for more dead bodies in his house of worship. Do you? No, please, don't. I'll come with you. He swallowed hard, his words caught in his throat. Just don't hurt anyone else. Now that's the spirit. His confessional door finally opened. Pale gray eyes stared back. Cruel eyes. The large man dressed in dark clothing and a long coat yanked him from the booth. The stranger's hand dug fingers into his neck. Two other men stood at his shoulder. Their footsteps resounded on the tile floor as they headed down the aisle toward the entrance. His eyes darted across the small chapel, desperately trying to make eye contact. Several parishioners had their backs turned, heads lowered in prayer. No one would notice him leave. He considered running or fighting his way free, but these men meant business. Someone would die. Then his eyes found those of a small Asian woman covered in a dark shawl. He'd never seen her before. Her dark eyes followed his gaze, but he couldn't read her expression. She did nothing to help or give any indication she was aware of the danger he was in. In an instant, he'd been pulled past her. His last hope gone. His captors shoved open the front door to the church and hauled him outside. Cold night air shocked his system. The harsh reality of his predicament hit home. He looked over his shoulder one last time. Father Antonio feared he would never see St. Sebastian's again. She stood and sidestepped toward the aisle of the church, genuflecting as she exited the pew. Jasmine waved a hand in the sign of the cross, having seen the gesture before. She didn't wish to stand out. As she neared the back of the chapel, she lowered the shawl from her head, then gripped the butt of the gun in her coat pocket. With caution, she peered out the heavy wooden door at the side entrance, not wanting to draw attention to herself. Logan and two of his men escorted the holy man to a car they had parked along the street. The little priest did not look pleased by their intrusion. After they drove away, she reached for her cell phone. You were right, Nikki. Things just got more interesting. How so, my dear? His seductive voice teased her ear and brought a smile to her lips. Logan has called upon a higher power in his search. Before he asked any more questions, she added, And it doesn't matter where the raven has flown. Soon I will know where she will be. The hyena offers bait 
she won't be able to refuse. I trust you implicitly, Mantis. You know my wishes. Yes, I do. She smiled, picturing his handsome face. And I will not fail you. Jasmine ended the call and walked to her car parked on a nearby side street. No need to hurry. The tracking beacon would make her job easy, and she had a suspicion where Logan might be headed. Her mind went over the inventory of the equipment in the trunk of her car as a plan took shape. Nikki always made sure she had the best of everything. The trick would be in not calling attention to her employer, but one thing was absolute. She would not deprive Nikki of his victory. Raven stood beside the sofa, hands on her hips. Anxiety and frustration colored her words. Talk to me, Christian. I helped you lug that thing across the grounds and into your living room. What did you see? We're a team, remember? Brooding silence. Sitting on the area rug, his back against the sofa, he crossed his arms over his chest and stared intently at the old trunk. With jaw clenched, he glared at it as if it were a living, breathing thing, ready to lash out at him. His dark green eyes swirled with anger and... confusion. She'd never seen him so lost. Clearly he felt disturbed by the contents he'd discovered hidden away in Fiona's attic. But he hadn't spoken a word since he pried open the lid. Please, Christian. She lowered her voice and knelt beside him, a hand on his shoulder. Say something. After a long silence, his expression softened. Raven, you have to trust me. I know I haven't given you much reason to do that, but I need some time to myself. He reached for her hand, holding it in his. Then he took a deep breath, fixing his eyes on her. In that locker are... He paused and shut his eyes, letting the emotion wash over him. She watched him struggle to find his way. My past is there. But I gotta do this alone. Do you understand? She swallowed the lump in her throat, moved by compassion for his personal journey. Whatever he'd found had stirred up a past already embroiled in mystery. She couldn't imagine the demons lying in wait for him now. Raven understood his need for privacy, but it broke her heart that he wanted to do it alone. I can be a good listener if you want to talk. She squeezed his hand. I wish you'd let me help. I just can't. Not with this. Letting go of her hand, he kissed her cheek, then whispered, Good night. If you need me, for anything... She returned his affection, then slowly stood. I will, he assured her. But as she neared the bedroom doors, he called out to her, And Raven? Thanks. It pained her to leave him sitting on the floor under the pale light of a lamp, all his attention focused on the locker across from him. She left the bedroom doors open a crack. If he called out to her in the middle of the night, she wanted to hear it. Even when the morning came, would he share what he'd found? Share his pain? It would be a very long night. A muffled groan woke her. The room was pitch black. It took a moment to orient herself. Then a cry jarred her and raised the hair at the nape of her neck. Sitting upright, she listened for the sound, unsure what had happened. God help us, please! He shrieked, fear bellowing deep. Let me go. Shut up, man. Please! You're hurting me! She thrust the covers off her legs and ran to the living room, throwing the bedroom door open. I'm here, Christian. You're okay. The lamp was still on. Tossing his boots and folded jeans to one side, she knelt on the floor near him, running her fingers over his fevered brow. But he solidly resisted the gesture, still snarled in his ordeal. Now I lay me down to sleep, he muttered, eyes closed tight. He thrashed at his sheets as he lay on the couch. The bare skin of his chest glistened with sweat. If I should die before... She touched his arm, not knowing how to awaken him without causing more damage. Make them go away. 
Don't touch me! The panic in his voice ranged from childlike to threatening within seconds, as if he were possessed. Christian, you're safe! It's me, Raven! With a swing of his arm, he knocked her over, his frenzy escalating. She had to take charge now. She stood quickly, then waited for the right moment to gain control of his arms. She pressed hard, practically sitting on his chest to make him stop. Christian, wake up! Now! she shouted. His eyes popped open at the sound of his name, but the fog hadn't cleared. She had to get his attention. Talk to me. Can you hear me? He finally released the tension in his muscles and gasped. With a low moan, he shifted his gaze as if seeing her for the first time. Raven? he whispered. His eyes darted around the room. He looked so lost. What are you doing here? You were having a nightmare. She lowered her body to the floor. Kneeling by the sofa, she stroked his brow. Are you okay? Damn, that was so. Christian stared at the ceiling, looking exhausted by his effort to recall. It was happening all over again. I'm going to get you some water. She raced to the kitchen and filled a glass, keeping her attention on him as she dampened a washcloth. All these old memories must have stirred it up. Can you remember any of it? Raven hurried back to his side. After raising up on one elbow, he gulped at the water, letting it dribble down his chin. She ran the wet cloth down his arms and over his forehead, cooling his skin. I've had this one before. When I was younger. He coughed, then took another gulp of water. It used to happen all the time. Who is Shadow Man? What? By his expression, he was shocked by her words. How did you know about? You cried out the name, like he hurt you. Don't you remember? Oh, God. He rubbed fingers hard across his forehead, then sat upright, pulling the sheet over his boxers. Shadow Man. That's what I called him, when I didn't understand. Raven sat beside him on the couch, waiting for him to remember. With his breathing more stable, he stared ahead, wrapped in his memory. The Shadow Man. He was my... father. The word father stuck in his throat. In a daze, he continued, It took years of therapy for me to understand that. In the dark, all I saw was... his shadow... And with the confusion that night, I thought he was there to kill me. With such trauma, it's understandable. You were just a child. She dabbed the cool rag to his temple. But she had the feeling he wasn't aware of her touch. Not any more. After they shot my sister. And mother. A tear rolled down his cheek, his eyes suspended in a blank stare. He came to my room. He'd been shot, but he fought them off to get to me. The smell of blood was everywhere. His face blurred through the tears welling in her eyes. She saw the child he'd been as he struggled to relive his past. It wasn't until he hugged me that I recognized his voice. He calmed me down, then held me out the window. He began to rock back and forth on the sofa where he sat. His eyes were still clouded by his nightmare. I fell to the ground, my ankle on fire. I crawled away, but the darkness seemed to squeeze my chest. It smothered me. I couldn't breathe. I felt so helpless. She suddenly understood his obsession to train and fight in the dark. He had to overcome his phobia, regain control of his life. A frightened young boy had found his own road to recovery. Then they shot him again. And again. I couldn't take my eyes away. His body convulsed until he fell against the window. I knew he was dead. Even in the dark I pictured his face. He stopped his rocking, furrowing his brow as if he were confused. Then the night sky filled with spiraling lights red and blue, shrieking and high-pitched sounds. She'd read about his past in the newspaper clippings from Father Antonio. 
His family tragedy was blamed on a bungled police raid. Yet something in his story bothered her. The timing was off. But Christian, if the night sky filled with lights of red and blue after your family was already dead, how could the police be responsible? For a moment, he fell silent, using the time to replay his own words back. She saw him fight to remember every last detail. But Fiona told me. His breathing became more rapid and shallow. Closing his eyes tightly, he grappled with his memory. It pained her to watch him go through it. She felt powerless to help. If the police weren't responsible, then who killed them? He raised his voice, pleading for an answer. Who killed my family? His expression changed, his eyes widening with a realization. As if he'd been struck in the face, he dropped to the floor on his knees. He yanked open the old trunk, throwing its contents on the rug. A child's schoolwork and crayon drawings were strewn at her feet. She joined him, picking up the pieces and taking a closer look. A small curl of dark hair was wrapped in plastic, tied in a pale blue ribbon. She had a similar one from when she was a baby. None of this made sense. These are your things, Christian. When you were a child, how did Fiona get a hold of these? I thought she took you in after your family was killed. Did she get these things from the Delacorts? He didn't answer. He found an old photograph and stared at it, totally consumed. After a moment, he muttered, "Look at this. Something bothered me about this old photo." He thrust the faded picture into her hand. Christian, as a young boy, stood beside his father in front of a car. Their faces were beaming. He was dressed in a little league uniform, his hand still in a baseball glove. His father stood behind him, hands on Christian's narrow shoulders. A nice picture, but she couldn't see the significance of it. What? I don't see. Christian never let her finish. He pointed to the image, his finger directing her to the car behind them. See, in the reflection on the windshield, check out who's taking the picture. It took her only a moment to recognize the face behind the camera. Fiona, she whispered. The pieces to his puzzle were falling into place, but things were still cloudy for her. When I first went through this, I kept coming back to this photo. I just now realized why. He reached again into the locker and retrieved a bundle of old letters, and earlier I found these. All the letters were addressed to Fiona, sent to a post office box, but the return address caught her attention. These letters are from the Delacorts, and they go back for years before they were killed. How can that be? She questioned. What connection did they have to Fiona? All the letters are progress reports. On me. He handed her a folded piece of paper, yellowed with age. Christian stared at it as if it were vile, and this is the reason why. Raven carefully unfolded the stiff paper. The elaborate blue border registered in her brain. Your birth certificate, Christian Evan Fitzgerald, born to Fiona Fitzgerald, no father listed. He clenched his jaw. All these years, she lied to me. Fiona is my mother. The Delacorts weren't. He couldn't bring himself to say it aloud. How could she watch me go through all that pain and not tell me? Why did she give me away in the first place? And she kept up with you all those years. Only a mother would. It doesn't make any sense, Christian. Setting the certificate aside, she pulled him to her, closing her eyes as she hugged him. And the worst part, he burrowed his face into her neck. She barely heard the words. I remembered something from the dream the last time I had it. Whoever killed my, the Delacorts, was after me. I was the reason they broke into the house. I remembered them saying they were after the boy. Find the boy. 
eyes wide with her shock, Raven pushed back. Her mind searched for the words to console him. How do you know? You can't know that for sure. You were too young. I blocked out so much. I thought it was the trauma I'd gone through, but now it's all beginning to make a twisted kind of sense. But why? Why would someone want to kill a little boy? Slowly, he shook his head. His exhaustion showed. She felt certain he hadn't even heard the question she posed. All I know is that it was my fault. He avoided her eyes and stared into the locker. They died because of me. She understood survivor's guilt, had seen it before. Nothing she could say would raise him from the depths of his unfounded blame. Raven felt the magnitude of his loss. The death of the Delacortes had forever robbed him of his childhood, his sense of well-being. Just as the death of her father had done to her, magnified tenfold. Raven pulled him to her, kissing him until he responded. He collapsed in her arms, worn out by his emotional roller coaster. Her comfort didn't last long. He let her go and looked over his shoulder. Raven, I need to understand. His voice trailed off as he bowed his head, his eyes drawn once again to the memories strewn along the floor. Why is my life so surrounded by death? The old trunk embodied Fiona's betrayal and the violent death of the only family he had ever known. Raven just wanted it gone, out of his sight. Don't do this to yourself. Someone else is responsible. You were only a... a scared little boy. She swallowed the lump in her throat. A tear slid down her cheek. He avoided her eyes. It pained her to see him like this. She stroked his cheek with her fingertips, then caressed his face in her hands, lowering her lips to his. An impulse. The kiss started as a gentle and nurturing connection. The warmth and smell of his skin made her lose herself to the sensation. But as a shudder ran through his body, she felt his need take over. Christian pulled her into his arms, his body hard against her. A low moan exposed his urgency. She couldn't stop it, even if she wanted to. Her velvet softness jolted every fiber of his being. The scent of her warm skin drilled his senses. Christian picked her up and carried her to his bedroom. His mind grappled with his desire for romance with this woman, to take his time making love to her. But he knew this was all about one thing— need. No turning back now. His body stiffened with the curves of her flesh pressed hard against him. With all the reminders of death around him, he desperately wanted to feel alive, to replace the pain. I want you. I need. She smothered his words with a passionate kiss. And as he set her down by the bed, he replenished his spirit with the longing in her eyes. Backlit by the pale light from a lamp on the nightstand, she looked like an angel, with devilish intentions. Her eyes probed his body, devouring him like he was food. No more talking. With a wicked smile, she raised her arms above her head, inviting him to explore with a whisper. I surrender. She wore a large navy tee with police academy emblazoned on the front in bold white letters. Without taking his eyes from hers, he trailed his fingers to her thighs. Slowly he caressed her warm skin, raising the thin cotton inch by agonizing inch. Pulling the tee over her head, he watched her hair cascade to her shoulders, her pale skin made more perfect by the dark strands. Adrenaline and anticipation surged through his muscles when she returned the gesture, sliding his black boxers down his thighs to the floor. Her hands lingered in all the right spots. Completely unencumbered, the sensation of skin on skin drove him insane. Kneeling at her feet, he stroked her with the tip of his tongue. The sound of her pleasure filled the air. His lips explored her body, eager to learn every nuance of her sensuality. 
she collapsed to the mattress and pulled him with her. As her mouth nuzzled him, every movement of her tongue, every touch of her teeth made him shudder. The sound of her moans reverberated against his skin, sending quivers through his belly. Not being able to control himself any longer, he rolled onto one elbow, pulling her to him, plunging his tongue into her warm mouth. He could no longer resist what she offered. He pleasured her with his fingers, then rolled his hips against hers, wedging himself between her legs. "'Oh, please! Yes!' she cried out as he pressed into her for the first time. "'Don't stop!' Tears streaked her face as he filled her, her velvety tightness claiming him. With her outcry, he thought he'd hurt her and almost stopped, but she encouraged him with her throaty moans and urgent kisses. Aroused by her hunger, he plunged deeper, his sense of urgency swelling. Cradling her hips with his hands, he thrust until she clutched his back. Her orgasm rippled through her in forceful waves. Raven's cries of pleasure taunted him until he couldn't control himself any longer. Arching his back, he exploded with his own powerful release. He filled her time and time again, then shuddered in exhaustion. Depleted of his strength, he was seized by the faint tremors of complete gratification. He'd never felt so... alive. Christian rolled onto his back, pulling her with him. She fell limp against his chest. Kissing the top of her head, he nuzzled closer, never wanting to let her go. As he stroked her hair, she raised her chin, finding his eyes in the dim light. Her pale skin glimmered with beads of sweat and the enticing blush of sex. "'God, you're beautiful.' The words were out of his mouth before he even realized he'd spoken. "'That's funny. I was just thinking the same thing of you.' Her shy smile disarmed him. Then her expression grew more solemn. Let's switch places. I want to hold you, Christian, until you fall asleep. Her offer touched him, compassion brimming in her eyes. He fondled a strand of her hair, then kissed her with all the tenderness he felt in his heart. Violence had stilted his life, robbed him of innocence. His repeated visits to the cemetery fed his obsession for penance as a sole survivor, like an addict on a fix, but the pain and emptiness never went away. Over the years, he'd become the master at erecting barriers to keep people at a distance. Hiding his emotional scars had become second nature, a draining effort. Now someone else knew his pain, all of it, and he'd let it happen. Somehow it felt right. With her, it had been effortless. Making love to Raven forged a deep bond between them. She touched him in a place he thought had died long ago. Nothing he had experienced before matched how he felt, just holding her. Drawing the comforter and sheets over their bodies, he nestled into her embrace, welcoming her comfort. He fit to her body like it was always meant to be listening to the beat of her heart in the stillness of the early morning. In her arms, he'd never felt so connected to another human being. The intimacy of the gesture seduced him. He drifted to sleep, completely letting go, reliving his pleasure with the woman who held him in her arms. Only Raven mattered. Chapter 14 the gray haze of winter's morning shone through the draperies of Christian's bedroom as he opened his eyes. It took his mind a moment to remember the trunk filled with the awful truth. His world had come to a grinding halt. An uneasy sadness dampened his spirit. The foundation of what he had believed lay crumbled in the wake of Fiona's lie. Seek the truth, Christian. The message pinned to the body of Mickey Blair taunted him. Who could have engineered such a thing? And for what purpose? He still felt no closer to that answer. Just when the venom of bitterness threatened to contaminate his day, the warm body next to him stirred. 
He gazed upon Raven as she nestled into his shoulder, strands of dark hair lying across her pale cheek. Asleep, she looked like an innocent child. How had a guy like him gotten so lucky? He smiled as he gently pulled back the hair from her face with a finger. A sweet moan reminded him of his change in fortune. He didn't feel alone any more. With her skin next to his, his body reacted, stiffening with the memories of last night still fresh in his mind. Gently, he kissed the top of her head, then rolled to his side. He cradled her in his arms, his lips in search of his favorite places. Mmm, so good. Her voice sounded throaty and suggestive as he nuzzled her ear. You an early riser? A smile graced her lips, warming his heart. She kept her eyes closed as her hand reached for him. Always, he answered, her velvet touch inspiring him. I believe in rigid discipline. A faint gasp escaped his mouth as her hand came to rest. Oh, yeah. I see that, she purred. Let me put you through your paces. Nothing like an early morning workout. This time it would be about Raven. Christian would learn the subtleties of her body, giving her the pleasure she deserved. And with Raven, he forgot the ugliness of his past, no longer dwelling on the crippling pain of it. For the first time, he felt whole, brimming with hope for his future. With the shower still going, Christian grinned, remembering how Raven had joined him earlier. She taught him the lost art of sudsing, as she called it. Her workout routine left him drained, but completely relaxed. Laughing aloud had never felt so good. Wearing only his thick navy bathrobe, he headed for the kitchen to start the coffee, a grin still on his face. But when he stepped through the door of the master suite, all that changed. Reality hit hard. The contents of the old trunk lay strewn on the floor of his living room, his discovery harsh in the morning light. To punctuate the blow, the abrasive sound of his cell phone reminded him that life went on. Retrieving his phone from the coffee table where he'd left it the night before, he answered the call. Delacourt. Yeah, boss, Bill Edwards here. He recognized the voice of his trusted security man at Dunhill. I just heard from the hangar. You wanted me to keep you informed on the whereabouts of Mrs. Dunhill. Yeah, something new? Christian kept his tone steady, but his heart was another matter. The pilot has got a flight plan returning to the Dunhill hangar. She's heading back to Chicago. Her ETA is four this afternoon. She's asked for a pickup. Bill cleared his throat, broaching an opinion. I figured if she called for a ride from security, she hadn't contacted you. What do you want me to do? He closed his eyes. And so it began. Fiona was coming home. A part of him felt relieved to finally know her whereabouts. But an even bigger part was angry as hell at her gall. She'd left him to deal with the murder, intentionally holding back her secrets. Why come back now? Since she hadn't called him, did she have any intention of contacting him at all? No pickup, Bill. I'll do it myself. Thanks for the heads up. He ended the call and tossed the phone onto the sofa, then pulled a hand through his damp hair. Damn, he muttered. Something wrong? You look upset. Raven's voice came from behind him. Dressed in his white bathrobe, she towel-dried her hair. No, just something at Dunhill Tower. I'm going to have to drive to the city this afternoon. He busied himself with a coffee and hoped she hadn't seen his uneasiness. His meeting with Fiona had to be one-on-one. -on -one. Even though he had a personal connection to Raven, she still worked for the police. His instincts told him to honor the loyalty to his... to Fiona. The word mother stuck in his craw. At this point, he wasn't sure he could ever bring himself to call her that. Yet before all this, he would have been honored by the privilege. You'll be safe here while I'm gone. I'll leave instructions with my men before I take off. It'll only take a few hours. Oh, no, you don't. You're not going to ditch me again, she teased with a smirk. If you're going into Chicago, I'd like to hitch a ride. Can you drop me off at the station house? 
Her suggestion was not unreasonable. Unreasonable would have been her insisting that she drive her own car in total disregard for her own personal safety. But her compromise took him by surprise. His mind raced with how this scenario might play out. He finally thought of a way to keep Raven off his scent and meet with Fiona alone. The execution of his plan would be tricky. I've got a better idea. You drop me off at the tower, then you can have my SUV. But I need to know where you'll be. No deviations. If you're at work, I figure you can't be any safer than that. But promise me you won't deviate from the plan. Stepping closer, he trailed a finger down her cheek and stared into those dark eyes. And I want your cell phone number, so I can find you when I'm ready to leave. His smile felt forced. Christian hoped she wouldn't notice. He hated lying to her. Okay, I understand. But I can take care of myself, you know. Raven crooked an eyebrow and lowered her eyes to his chin. He stared at her for a moment, then chuckled, rubbing his jaw. Yeah, I found that out the hard way. That was just a little love tap. She raised up on tiptoe and kissed his bruised lip. Something I learned from the WWE. I should have figured you for a girl into wrestling. He kissed her cheek, then whispered in her ear, When we hook up later, I'll show you some of my patented moves. No spandex required. My, you are a man of many talents, Hunk Hogan, move over. I believe that's Hulk Hogan, he murmured. <laughs> Whatever. Wedging herself between him and the counter, she undid the tie to his robe, sliding her fingers to his bare skin. He slipped his hands under her robe, allowing them to stray. He closed his eyes and nuzzled her neck, drinking in the smell of her skin. The woman made it damned hard for him to ignore her. Yep, Raven made it damned hard, always. By mid-afternoon, the sun speared through the dark clouds only sparingly, dashing Christian's hope for a better day. He followed Raven out the front door of his cottage, setting the alarm and locking it behind him. The air smelled heavy with moisture. Today's forecast called for thunderstorms later in the afternoon. On his front step, he turned up the collar to his long black overcoat and heaved a sigh, his eyes fixed on the gathering clouds overhead. Even Mother Nature had conspired against him. With his mind being so troubled, he wondered how he'd ever hide it from his beautiful passenger. He should have enjoyed the ride into Chicago. Raven did her best to distract him. Somehow, even with a ruthless killer stalking her, with murder and mayhem blowing his life to smithereens, the intriguing woman at his side made their time together feel normal. Idle conversation should have been a welcome respite from the scenarios jumbling in his brain. Yet all he thought about was Fiona. He had no idea how this would play out. The uncertainty wrenched his gut. As the traffic picked up and they neared downtown Chicago, Raven yanked him from his brooding. You've been putting up a pretty good front, but I can tell. Something's bothering you. Can you talk about it? She looked up from keying her cell phone number as a speed dial entry into his phone, her dark eyes filled with concern for him. He felt like such a jerk. His rendezvous with Fiona loomed heavy between them, a barrier he couldn't deny. But he wasn't prepared to talk about it, at least not yet. A part of him wanted to tear down that wall of lies. For so many years, that obstacle had amassed deep within him like a cancer. It kept him a prisoner to his past. He wondered what it would feel like to shed light on all his dark secrets. The burden finally lifted, and he imagined doing exactly that with Raven. But he took the path of least resistance. I can't, not yet. He stared out the windshield, gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. He made the turn down Michigan Avenue, heading for Dunhill Tower, then broke the strained silence between them. But I want to. Just have a little more patience with me. I gotta sort through some stuff first. He pulled to the curb in front of the tower and left the SUV running. Reaching over, he touched a finger to her cheek, then leaned toward her. With fingers laced in her hair, he kissed her, drawing from her humanity to fortify him. 
As his lips touched hers, his mind flooded with images of Raven, his heart unwilling to leave her behind. But he had to. With his past so much of a hindrance, he had to find a way to set himself free from it. And it was a journey he had to make alone. Remember, no deviations, and I'll call you when I'm done so we can set up a time for the ride home. He forced a smile, tapping an index finger to the tip of her nose. You got my number. Maybe we can swing by the hospital to see Tony later. Yeah, no problem. He yanked open the door to the car and waited for her to come around to slip into the driver's seat. After a final kiss and a wave goodbye, Christian stood at the curb, watching her drive away. Under his overcoat, he reached for the cell phone clipped to the belt of his jeans. He hit a speed dial, then headed for the front entrance of the building, his face hardened by determination. The man answered on the second ring. Edward's here. Yeah, Bill, this is Christian. I've got a favor to ask. Anything, what do you need? Get me a pool car. I'm heading out to the hangar to pick up Fiona. Sure thing. Anything else? Yeah, just one more thing. I want you to start tracking the GPS on my SUV. I'll fill you in when I see you upstairs. You loaned out your high-tech baby? The man teased. Who is she? What makes you think? With a grin, Christian shook his head. Never mind. Just tell me if it deviates from the South State Street area of downtown. He ended the call and pushed through the revolving door, waving an acknowledgment to the guards at the front security kiosk. With the change in logistics, he knew the timing would be tight now. His face taut, he shifted focus. Soon he'd be seeing Fiona again— and in a whole different light, and he still had no idea what would come out of his mouth. It'll be one of life's little mysteries, he muttered under his breath as he hit the elevator button, riding up alone. He jammed his hands into the pockets of his coat, clenching his fists. Cynicism gripped him hard, coupled with a mounting resentment. Christian felt certain that seeing Fiona again would only reinforce his callous attitude. His mind reeled with all the questions he would demand her to answer. Welcome home, Fee. He furrowed his brow. It's a whole new world. Raven spent the first hour reviewing the case files Sam had laid on her desk, the ones from her father's past. Sam had placed a note on the top file, telling her he'd already conducted a background check on the top scumbag list. He'd narrowed the prospects considerably. She set down her pen after making the final entry into her casebook. The connection to her father was a slender thread, and she knew it. It's going to be a crapshoot. She sighed, then dosed herself up with the caffeine from stale coffee. Her eyes trailed over to her partner's desk as she repeated a line from the movie Top Gun. Talk to me, Goose. Tony always used the old line whenever he felt the need for her sage advice. Now the tables were turned. She picked up the phone and placed a call to the hospital, needing to hear the voice of her wingman. But first she would speak to the guardian at the gate to get the truth. How is he, Yolanda? She tightened her grip on the phone, holding her breath as she waited to hear. He's in stable condition, thank God. And the doctor says his prognosis looks good. She heard a smile in Yoli's voice. The woman was practically giddy. He's eating up a storm. Can you imagine him eating hospital food without loading it down with hot sauce? I couldn't be happier. Raven pictured her smiling face. Her euphoria was contagious. Oh, that's so good to hear. Call me if there's anything I can do for you or his parents. Her eyes welled with tears, happy to hear the good news. Can I speak to him? Oh, sure, just a minute. She heard Yolanda's voice in the background and a rustle of fabric. In a moment, she heard Tony on the line. Hey, Mac. His voice sounded weak, nowhere near his old self, but he still sounded damn good to her. How's the case? Hey, Tony. I've made some headway, but I miss my partner. Raven worried about telling him too much. She imagined how she'd feel if their situations were reversed, and she was the one flat on her back, unable to help. 
I hear from the guys that Sam is helping you with some old case files. How's that going? She closed her eyes and shook her head. Tony was one tough guy, still working the case, even from the hospital. And the constant flood of visitors in blue uniforms would have kept him plugged in. No use shielding him from anything. I'm staring at a stack of old case folders right now. Thanks to Sam's help, we started with eleven cases, but are now down to four. She flipped open her case notes and reviewed the summary. Two are dead, three in prison, one deported, and one moved out of state. That leaves four still living in the greater Chicago area. She read the rap sheets of the final four to him. Real maggots, huh? His breathing sounded labored. What does your gut say? It took her a moment to retrieve one file. Flipping over the cover, she held up the mugshot inside. Dad made a personal note in one of his case books. He wrote gray dead eyes like it really was supposed to mean something. My money is on Dad and old gray eyes Logan McBride, but unfortunately we've got no address on him. Staring at the old black and white photo, she knew her father had been dead on. The man made her skin crawl, even in 2D. The old rap sheet was a long one, and her father had arrested the bastard on a grand theft auto when he'd been a teen. But even at that age, McBride had all the makings of a hard case. Follow your instincts, Raven. My money's on you. Tony cleared his throat. How are things going with Delacorte? Images of Christian flashed in her mind, his handsome face, the feel and smell of his skin. She had it bad. The time she'd spent with him now felt like a surreal dream, and a hollow sensation plagued her with the mention of his name. Raven craved him like a junkie off a bender. Too good. I just feel like pinching myself like I'll wake up and he would be a figment of my sex-starved imagination. Oh, Lord, I think that falls under TMI, too much information. His attempt at laughter turned into a coughing jag. She knew it was time to cut the conversation short. Yeah, guess so. I forgot you're such a lightweight. She grinned. Hey, Tony, I miss you, and I'm glad you're okay. I've been praying for you, you know. It was true. She found herself talking to no one, in her own head, confiding the desperation and fear for her partner's safety. It took her a moment to finally recognize that she was praying. Out of practice as she was, it felt like the closest she'd come to believing again. And with Tony taking a turn for the better, who was she to argue with the process? We'll wanders never cease he replied. Take care, Mac. Let me know how those hard cases turn out. I will, partner. I miss you. Did I mention that? Yeah. A time or three. She hung up the phone, struggling to control a grin. Maybe things would turn out after all. A menacing rumble called her attention to the window. The sky had turned nearly black with the onset of dusk and a brewing storm. The thunder bumper had been expected, but its timing for the five o'clock rush hour was just plain cruel. The ominous rumble made her skin crawl. Maybe her optimism was a bit premature. A crack of thunder made her jump. Her pulse quickened. Fiona felt thankful the jet had landed before the weather had gotten this bad. She clutched at her coat collar and drew it tighter around her throat. Her eyes peered over her shoulder into the gloom. The rain poured down like the heavens were angry, and she understood why. With luggage near her feet, she paced the small waiting room of the Dunhill hangar, glancing at her watch once again. She'd asked for a ride to meet her. The service was late. Rush hour traffic and the bad weather no doubt contributed to the problem— but the delay didn't entirely displease her. It gave her time to think about what she would say to Christian when she saw him. Her son. A lump formed and wedged in her throat. Her beautiful son. 
She stopped and closed her eyes, clenching a fist to her lips and pressing hard to stanch the onset of tears. What would she say to him? She had come home to face Christian, to tell him everything. With the reality of that confrontation so near at hand, she wasn't sure she had the courage. But she owed him the truth, and so much more. The glass door opened behind her. Fiona turned, expecting to see a security driver with her limousine service. She flinched, a gasp punctuating her surprise. Christian? Her voice quivered. He stood at the door, raindrops clinging to his dark hair, his face slick from the downpour. Those brooding green eyes told her all she needed to know. It had taken years of therapy to find even a semblance of joy buried deep in them, and even those moments were few. But something else lurked beneath the surface of his eyes. Resentment. It was undeniable. Surprised to see me? Cynicism colored his voice. No more of a shocker than when I came home to find you gone, leaving me in the lurch, neck deep in a murder investigation. He hit dead center. Christian never minced words. She wasn't sure she could take the strain of his hostility. And when he bridged the gap between them, stepping closer, her throat tightened. How could she justify what she'd done? If I'd stayed, it would have been worse. She wanted to explain, find the words to make it all right. But everything she said came out wrong. Christian was an intelligent, sensitive man. He would see through her stonewalling. Worse for whom? For me? Or for you? I guess you want me to believe you left to protect me. His face grew cold with skepticism. Nice try. Pardon me if I sound cynical these days. This was not how she'd envisioned their conversation, but she deserved the full force of his bitterness. Now Christian moved even closer. Her arms ached to hold him, finally as his mother, but she knew he'd never allow it. Clenching his jaw, he took another tack. I found out someone else was very interested in your whereabouts, besides me. Did your past catch up with you, Fee? Nicky. What did he know about Nicholas? A sinister growl of thunder mirrored her fear. The rain continued its assault, crying the tears she held back. She had never known Christian to be cruel, but it was clear in his taunt. He had been hurt by her betrayal. The use of his nickname for her twisted his words like a knife to her heart. She merited every ounce of his animosity. Yes, I suppose it did. She should have known she could never flee the reality of her base nature. Nicky had stirred the pot, but it was a black kettle of her own creation. She had no one else to blame. I should have known I would never outrun it. I just wish— Regret choked her, but the pain in his eyes tightened the noose. Were you ever planning to tell me the truth? he asked. His words struck her. Eyes wide, she couldn't hide her reaction. The truth? What did he know, exactly? Once this all began, she had wanted to ease him into the reality of his past, but everything had happened too fast. Her instincts forced her to stall, to find out precisely what he knew before she blundered with a reply. I wanted to. Her response sounded cagey, even to her. You deserve to know everything. And by the look of him, Christian wasn't buying her trite justification. Good intentions aren't gonna cut it. When I needed some answers and you weren't around, I searched your personal things. He broke his accusing stare for the first time. His admission apparently shamed him. But he soon recovered. Sarcasm returned to his tone. I hope you'll forgive the intrusion and the breach of faith. Trust is so rare. It should be cherished, don't you think? At least, that's what I believed when I was more gullible. He no longer looked at her. 
Folding his arms across his chest, he turned aside and shut his eyes with the strain. After a long moment of silence, he looked over his shoulder. It disturbed her to see him so hurt. I thought I knew you. And myself. Guess I was wrong on both counts. He spoke in such a hushed tone that she nearly didn't hear him over the storm. Yet even through the low timbre of his voice she heard the wounded child. That child had been burned into her memory, branded forever by the condemnation of her actions. She raised a hand to touch his shoulder, but stopped short. "'Tell me what you know, Christian. Please.' Rain pelted the window, blowing sideways with erratic winds. Her concentration waned as the blustering storm elevated her uneasiness. It was after five when Raven glanced to the clock on the bullpen wall. She had expected to hear from Christian by now. Playing over their last conversations in her head, she wondered what had happened at work that would keep him so late. Didn't he have enough on his plate without the added stress? And with his employer being Fiona Dunhill, the woman who'd kept such damaging secrets from her own son, her anxiety mounted. "'What's up with you, Christian?' she muttered. "'Hey, Mackenzie!' The desk sergeant poked his head through the doorway. "'I got a message to deliver. From Father Antonio?' He handed her a note. "'Why didn't you just direct the call back to me?' Her eyes were drawn to the pink slip of paper. Did he want me to call him back? She glanced up. No, he just wanted to leave the message. The officer slouched against the door frame. Seemed in a hurry. How did he know I was here? It seemed odd that the priest only left his message, not waiting to speak to her directly. She narrowed her eyes at the note, finding it hard to decipher the message. But the sergeant elaborated. Oh, he asked about you, and I told him you were here. Then he asked if he could just leave a message. The man shrugged. He wants you to meet him at the rectory in a half hour, by the side parking lot. Says he may have a witness for the Blair case. Oh, yeah? Well, what do you know? What's this about flashing something? I can't read your writing, Sarge. The man chuckled. Yeah, well, I can think of a couple things a man would like you to flash, Mackenzie. But this man is a priest for crying out loud. Show some respect. She rolled her eyes, then arched an eyebrow, waiting for him to answer. The note says that when you pull up, flash your lights and he'll join you. Guess he wants you to drive somewhere? With rush hour traffic, you might want to leave now, he added. Yeah, thanks, good idea. She suddenly remembered what Christian had told her. Promise me you won't deviate from the plan. A trip to St. Sebastian's definitely constituted a departure from their game plan, but surely he would understand— she was only meeting a priest at a church rectory. How dangerous could that be? A loud crack of thunder nearly jolted her from her seat. Both she and the sergeant looked out the window, catching a violent flash of light streaking across the sky. Rush hour's gonna be a bear. My workload's gonna triple, he scowled. You better get going. Drive safe. Yeah, later, Sarge. I gotta see a priest. I've always thought that'd be a good thing for you, Mackenzie. God works in mysterious ways. So I've heard. She shook her head and grinned at the man. After grabbing her coat, she put a hand on her Glock in its holster, an old habit when she was on the move. She glanced at her cell phone, checking the battery. It had plenty of juice. The plan could still work. He'd call her and she'd answer the phone. What could be simpler? Christian wondered the same thing. What? Did he know exactly? Good question, Fee, and a clever stall tactic. So much was supposition on his part. Only she knew all the answers. Lightning streaked across the night sky, hurling its wrath into the void, and with it his anxiety multiplied. Yet Christian persisted in this verbal joust with Fiona. The vaguer his responses, the more he might get her to admit. It was a gamble, but she was an intelligent woman, smart enough to outwit his lame attempt at a subtle interrogation, and the pained expression on her face made him feel heartless. Let's just say that I'm going to have mixed feelings when it comes to celebrating Mother's Day, 
He wanted to bite back his cynicism, but it swept through his words like an infection. He couldn't look at her any longer. Even with everything she'd done, she was still his mother. Nothing justified his cruelty to her, not without first hearing her side of it. Oh, God, you don't know how many times I wanted to tell you the truth, especially after— There's a lot I don't know, Mother dearest. He walked toward the glass door to the hangar waiting room, his eyes boring through the darkness beyond the lights of the small parking lot. Pulling back his coat, he jammed his hands into the pockets of his jeans. He caught her in the reflection of the glass. A shimmer of tears influenced the lines of her face. She looked older than her years. But there was still so much he needed to know. He couldn't spare her, not now. With her propensity to disappear, he had to know the truth before it was too late. He let his mind delve into the depths of his pain. And you just watched me go through that hell and didn't say a word. How could you? Why? Quietly, when she thought he hadn't noticed, Fiona clutched at her stomach as if she were nauseated. He knew the feeling. Slowly, she regained her composure and joined him at the door. She stood by his side and stared into the heavy rain. I know you're not going to believe this, but I did it for your own good. Closing his eyes, he tilted his head back, not sure he wanted to hear her crafty dodges. You owe me an explanation. Glaring forward, he kept his tone even. Let's start with something simple. Who were the Delacourts? If I was your son, how did I end up being raised by them? Flashes of his family's faces blew through his mind, like a reel of film played out of context, remembrances he thought he'd buried. Memories long forgotten suddenly sprang from the darkness. Strange images mirrored in the glass of the waiting room. Glimpses of a happier life. Loving smiles. Laughter. Childish games with his precocious younger sister. Replaced by the screams he knew well. And all that blood. Then, just as suddenly, the throng of memories faded. Yet one image remained. Bathed in light, Shadow Man now had a face a memory he would keep. John Delacourt. Fiona spoke the man's name as if she read his mind. Yes. His trance slowly cleared with the sound of his own voice. Christian gazed at Fiona. Odd. She had a smile on her face. I met him when I was pregnant with you, Christian. Back in those days there was such a stigma to an out-of-wedlock pregnancy. My family made excuses for me, sent me away. Pulling her coat around her, Fiona folded her arms. She stepped to the chairs across the room and collapsed into one. Her voice sounded very far away. He was a groundskeeper at the facility, Serenity Clinic in upstate New York. Very private, very discreet. John and I became friends. He was such a compassionate young man. She patted the seat next to her. Defeat showed on her face. He couldn't refuse her. Moving the chair from the wall, he squared off, facing her knee to knee. I couldn't give you up, especially not after seeing your eyes. Green like mine. She smiled. Tears pooled, then drained down her cheek. I was betrothed to Charles Dunhill, a very dangerous man, if he knew. It took her a moment to continue. I paid John to adopt you. Once I got married, I had access to more funds. It got easier to support you, to keep you hidden. I subsidized John and his growing family for years. He was such a good man. But you gave me up. Why? And why keep me hidden? Were you that ashamed? God, no! I loved you so much! A sob caught in her throat. She clutched at his hand. The unexpected touch made him flinch, but she held firm. It was her way. 
It broke my heart when I wasn't there to see your first steps, to hear you call someone else mother. With a frail hand, she wiped tears from her face. It was the best I could do, Christian. He narrowed his eyes. She still hadn't answered his question. Why did she keep him hidden? She caught his look of skepticism. Besides, John loved you like a son. After the years went by, I saw how much it meant for you to be a part of his family. He couldn't have loved you more if you were his own. I saw that, too. Her diversion worked, for an instant. Christian swallowed hard, choking back the emotion. What? She squeezed his hand, encouraging him. Say it. The connection he felt for Fiona now reminded him of the many conversations they had when he was a kid, so messed up. She had a gift. She could draw things from him that he didn't know were inside. Lately, I've been having that same recurring nightmare, the one I had when I was a kid, but this time I remembered more of it. His eyes found hers. My father. John saved my life. He died because of me. They all did. No, Christian. If anyone takes the blame, it should be me. I was too weak to deny my family and stand up to Charles. Don't do this to yourself. It wasn't the police that killed the Delacourts, was it? Why did you lie about that? His accusation came from nowhere, but he saw by her reaction that he'd stumbled onto the truth. She refused to answer. Fiona's jaw dropped, her eyes wide with his abruptness. He yanked his hand from hers and stared in disbelief. Damn it, you owe me the truth. Don't hold back now. She wasn't going to answer him, but he couldn't let it go. Standing, he thrust the chair out from under him and stalked toward the door. Those men were after me. I remembered that, too. Who killed the Delacourts, Fiona? I just can't. She pleaded for his mercy with her eyes and in the pitiable quiver of her voice. Saying it aloud. The truth is so ugly. I'm not ready for it. Not yet. Please. Can we go home? I need to go home. She looked lost. He had come so close to hearing it all. But her refusal now was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Fiona had to know the ramifications of her actions. Surely, if she knew, she would tell him everything. It was the only way. Charles Dunhill, the Delacourts, Mickey Blair. How many have to die for you to tell the truth? After you fled the country, one of the detectives on the case was gunned down on his front lawn in front of his family. The ICU is going to be his home for a while. The police believe it's the same man that killed Mickey. The shock on her face was undeniable, but he couldn't stop. And Detective Raven Mackenzie is under my protection because the same bastard is stalking her. I didn't know. You have to believe me if I had known. If you'd have known... Would you have come back at all? His words were brutal. They found voice through his pain and his betrayed trust. He glared, unwilling to mask his anger. What are you not telling me, Fiona? Who is my biological father? And did you have anything to do with the death of your own husband? As he gazed out the window, he heard the creak of a chair as she stood. In the reflection of the glass, he saw her walk toward him. Christian felt her presence by his side. Any other time in his life, the act would have given him comfort. But now, he knew pain would follow. He was about to learn the truth. Only the rhythm of the rain filled the emptiness until... My husband, Charles, killed the Delacourts. He made it look like a police raid gone bad, but it was all him. She cried her arms clutched around her waist. Her shoulders shook with every sob. I despised him for what he did. But why did he? What did they do to deserve that? He wanted you, Christian. He was after my son. Her eyes glazed over. She was in another world. We were so careful, John and I. 
but Charles must have found out. I never discovered how. She turned and reached for his arm. By the grace of God, you survived. Maybe John had more to do with that. I don't know. But I had to do it. Don't you see? Charles wouldn't have stopped trying to find you. To kill you. You were only a boy. She collapsed in his arms. He held her, supporting her weight until he walked her to a chair. I had to do it. I had no choice, she muttered, staring out the window as if he weren't there. I hired Mickey to kill my husband. It was the only way to keep you safe. Charles was such a jealous and vengeful man, and with his money he had a long reach. He gripped her hand as he knelt in front of her. The pieces to the puzzle had fallen into place. Only one question remained. Who's my father, Fee? Her eyes widened. She clenched her jaw. Suddenly, her cooperation ceased. Christian saw it in her face. She would keep her secret. And despite his complete devastation over her betrayal, he still loved her enough to let her go. You have a choice, Fee. You can get back on that plane. I won't tell them where you are. Bury yourself deeper this time. He lightly touched his fingers to the back of her hand, not taking his eyes from her. Or you can stay. Help me sort this out. But I'm not sure it's in your best interest to do that. Whatever you decide, I'll try to understand. He wanted to take her in his arms and protect her from her demons, as she had done for him all those years ago. But whatever would have happened, he'd never know. The harsh sound of his cell phone called for attention. In denial, he waited for the second ring to answer it. Yeah. She's on the move. The gruff voice of Bill Edwards yanked him from his misery. He stood and left Fiona sitting in the chair, confused by the look of concern on his face. You have the coordinates? He listened intently and shut his eyes tight, trying to regain his focus. I'm heading out now. Get someone over here to take Fiona anywhere she wants to go. When I get on the road, I'll call you again to feed me the information. Don't lose my SUV, Bill. He ended the call, his heart racing. Raven was on the move, even after promising she'd stay put. What's going on, Christian? Is it the case? I've got to go. Please don't shut me out now, she pleaded. What you did hurt me, Fiona. You lied to me all those years. Every time you comforted me after one of my nightmares, every time I raged against the police, blaming them for what happened, you perpetuated the lie. I'm not sure I can live with that. I'm not sure I want to. He stood and walked toward the door, leaving her behind. You severed the tie between us, not me. Having an attachment to you? It may come at too high a price. He swallowed hard, knowing his cruelty hit a new low. But he had no time to ease her burden. Raven needed him. I gotta go. Christian! Please! Ignoring her, he ran into the pouring rain. The weight of it soaked his hair and clothes. He dashed to his car, hitting the keyless remote and fumbling for the cell phone on his belt. Turning the ignition, he pulled from the parking space and hit the new speed dial for Raven. As it rang, he took a final look at Fiona alone in the waiting room, her face blanched by fluorescent lighting. She looked so small and frail. That image would haunt him, along with all the rest, and he deserved every ounce of guilt. Finally, he turned away. Come on, pick up, he urged. Raven didn't answer. When his call rolled into voicemail, he left a quick message, trying to hide the concern in his voice. But something wasn't right. His headlights caught the heavy drops bouncing off the pavement, his windshield wipers drumming a rhythm to match the cadence of his heart. Something felt terribly wrong. Taking a deep breath, he steadied his mind, employing the techniques he'd learned long ago to calm himself. With only a brief glance, he punched a second number on his cell. Staring into the night, his eyes on full alert, he steeled his senses for the hunt. Talk to me, Bill. 
The streets were congested with slow-moving traffic. Rolling along at twenty miles per hour, Raven knew she'd be delayed in meeting Father Antonio, and being late always made her anxious. It couldn't be helped. The storm robbed what precious little light remained of the day, and the pounding rain made visibility non-existent. For a moment, she considered pulling over to let the storm pass, but opted against it. At least she was moving. With the windshield wipers beating on high, she squinted through the downpour, tightening her grip on the steering wheel. The colorful lights of the city bled through the streaks of rain. Large drops pelted the SUV, making it hard to think. She saw Saint Sebastian's Church on the left and almost missed her turn. As she pulled into the side parking lot nearest the rectory, she parked the SUV but kept the engine running. Father Antonio would not recognize the vehicle as hers, so she followed his instruction and flashed the headlights. Nothing. She peered through the darkness, looking for any sign of life from the modest living quarters. From the corner of her eye, she saw a man in the shadows. Waving a hand and jogging up to her car from the right side, although the hood of the man's coat covered his face, she thought he might be the priest, judging by his build and stature. She narrowed her eyes and craned her neck for a better view, but as he drew closer, she saw the cross hanging from his neck, and she unlocked the doors. Suddenly, a dark shadow eclipsed the street lamp behind her. A motion caught her eye, reflected in the side mirror. A man crept toward her car, too damned sneaky to be harmless. On pure instinct, she reacted without hesitation. Laying her shoulder into it, she shoved at her door, jamming the heavy hunk of steel into the man like a weapon. With the first strike, he doubled over in pain. His arms attempting to shield his knees. To make her point again, she pulled the door back for a second assault. This time, she used her leg to thrust into him. As he fell to the ground, the man cried out, "Shit! Stop that bitch!" Grappling with her seatbelt, she had only an instant to make her next move as the man writhed on the ground. Blindly, she pressed the clasp of her safety belt, then felt for the butt of her gun. But the passenger side door flew open, and another man accosted her from the right, knocking the Glock from her hand into the shadows of the floorboard. "What the hell!" she cried. Raven kicked and punched, fighting the man in close quarters. Chicago police, back off! Her voice was loud and forceful, but her warning went unheeded. A shrill ring broke her concentration. Her cell phone, Christian, it had to be him. Like a cruel taunt, his words of reason repeated in her head: "Don't deviate from the plan." The image of Christian spurred her on. She couldn't let up now. But as she fought the second man, the delay allowed her first assailant to recover. He lunged through the driver's side door, gripping her neck with a beefy forearm, choking off her air. The distraction didn't daunt her. Still fighting the other guy, she drove a heel into his head as he came in from the passenger side. Connecting with the kick, she caught a glimpse of him falling to the ground with a grunt. But she had a bigger problem. Caught in a headlock, her airway squeezed tight. She wheezed her next breath, quickly losing control. The bastard yanked her from the driver's seat, not letting up on the pressure. Rain pummeled her face, making it hard to see. With very little effort, her assailant could snap her neck. She felt her arms and legs tingling, the numbness spreading. Shooting pinpoints of light played havoc with her eyes. Dizziness fogged her senses. Soon she'd lose consciousness. If that happened, she knew it would be over. With all her strength, Raven clenched her fist and stiffened her forearm, ramming her elbow hard into the solar plexus of the man behind her, just as she'd been trained. The first shot barely got the man's attention. The second time, he cursed with the damage she inflicted. His body felt like a brick wall. Her elbow quivered, deadened by pain. On the third punch, he loosened his grip around her neck and stumbled backward. It was all the break she needed. Raven spun and quickly shifted her hip behind him, then yanked his shoulders back with her right arm. His weight and momentum propelled him to the ground. 
As he lay stunned, she gripped his collar with her left fist to steady her target. Drawing back the heel of her right hand, she prepared to shatter his nose, driving bone splinters deep into his brain, dealing a death blow. But a hard metal object shoved against the back of her skull. It could be only one thing. She stopped cold. A menacing voice captured her attention through the driving rain. His rock steadiness told her he was in charge. You connect with that next shot, and the last thing you'll see is your brains all over Kruger's chest. Personally, I could care less one way or the other. So you take your pick. The man named Kruger blinked twice. Clearly unsure whether the man with the gun meant what he said, she, on the other hand, knew the ruthless scumbag meant every word. Deliberating her choices, she held firm to Kruger, a stubborn streak influencing her bravado. Raven knew she had little to think about. Attempting to recover, she drew cold air into her lungs. Her chest heaved with the effort. Her throat raw. The chilling rain seeped under her open coat and through to her skin. Strands of hair stuck to her face. It was over. Raven loosened her grip and raised her hands high. Still kneeling, she waited for the next instruction, hoping the man holding her at gunpoint wouldn't shoot her dead on the spot. As long as she was alive, she had hope. Stay on your knees. The man standing behind her laughed, a low, threatening sound. After all, you're practically at a church. Try saying a prayer if you think it'll help. Cupping his hand under her chin, he yanked her head back and stroked her neck with his icy, wet fingers. With the gun still to her ear, he whispered, "Seeing you so submissive, it's a real turn on." Every woman should know her place. And to Kruger, lying on the wet asphalt, he changed his tone and ordered, "Get up before she kicks your ass again." Kruger raised up on his elbows and drew the back of his hand over his mouth, the look in his eyes downright lethal. In a slow and deliberate manner, he stood, never taking his eyes off her. I think you really pissed him off. His vulgar laugh grated her nerves. Raven's eyes darted to the left, then right, looking for her next opportunity to strike back. But the man didn't give her a chance. Tie her up. Her hands were yanked behind her. She felt her wrists being bound. The sound of duct tape tearing off the roll. And to make matters worse, her phone erupted a second time, calling attention to her only lifeline. It must be Christian again. An arm reached from behind her and tugged at the phone on her belt. The man's hand palmed her in a vile manner, retrieving her badge. She's got an empty holster. Where's her gun? Another voice yelled, "Check the car, the floorboard on the passenger side. I seen it fall." She shut her eyes tight for an instant, then asked, "What's this all about?" No answer. She tried again. You have my badge. You know I'm a police officer with the Chicago PD. Oh, believe me, I know exactly who you are, Detective Mackenzie. A hand shoved her to the ground, and her feet were restrained in duct tape. She was going nowhere, trussed like a pig going to slaughter. Unceremoniously, she was jerked to her feet by the collar of her coat. Strong hands grasped both of her elbows. She teetered on her feet, unable to move. The man whose voice she'd come to recognize stepped around to face her, gray, dead eyes. You, she couldn't hide her reaction. Logan McBride. At your service. He looked surprised, but eventually smiled, touching a finger to his forehead in a mock salute. His looks didn't improve with the gesture. Now let's not keep Father Antonio waiting. If you've hurt him, her threat fell hollow, and by the look on McBride's face, he wasn't intimidated in the slightest. A grimace twisted his expression. I've heard enough from you, Mackenzie. You've got a big mouth, just like your daddy. 
He cut a piece of duct tape from the roll with a sharp knife. She watched him make the slice and wondered if this blade had slit Mickey Blair's throat. Jerking her head back, he stuck the tape across her mouth, shutting her up for good. Take her SUV and follow us to the location we talked about. Get going! In an instant, she heard Christian's car start up and screech away. Let's get out of here, he ordered. Hoisted from the ground, she was thrown over a man's shoulder. Bile rose hot from her belly. She dangled helplessly, her arms and legs useless. But she still had her mind. She could think. Where was Father Antonio? Since McBride had his cross, she assumed the priest was being held, or already dead. The injustice toward the innocent cleric enraged her. And another thing twisted her gut, ever since the break-in at her home. McBride had more to do with her father's past than Christian's. What was McBride's connection to Mickey Blair? Instinct told her McBride had killed the man. But for what reason? None of this made sense. Thrown into the back of a dark-colored and windowless utility van, she heard the doors slam shut, cocooned in darkness. As the engine rumbled and the vehicle lurched forward, a sense of foreboding seized her heart. Something else was very wrong. None of these men had made an effort to hide his face. Hell, McBride downright flaunted his ugly mug— not caring much how she recognized him. He even used Kruger's name without regard for secrecy. Raven felt certain they had no intention of letting her go. No doubt in her mind. She'd have to use her brain and fight like hell if she hoped to make it out alive. Chapter 15 The van finally came to a stop. In the dark, Raven listened for sounds of her captors as she wrestled with the duct tape binding her wrists. The damned tape hadn't budged the whole trip. She wrenched her jaw again, hoping to open her mouth, but nothing. The intensity of the rain dwindled to a faint tapping on the outside of the vehicle. Tensing her muscles, she rolled to face the door, preparing to kick it open. With her legs bound, she had no idea what she'd do next— but by the sound of things, more of McBride's men had gathered outside. She wouldn't stand a chance. As the van door opened, she stared into the grim faces of three men, then heaved a sigh. She had to be patient, pick her spot. Look what Logan gift-wrapped for us! One man laughed, his bristly face twisted to a sneer. Prime hunting stock! She wanted to respond, but her instincts warned her to play it smart. A hand gripped her ankle and tugged her effortlessly to the rear of the van. As she cleared the darkened interior, a man grabbed the edge of the tape covering her mouth and jerked it free, with no regard for her skin underneath. Hey, watch it! So much for playing it smart. She moved her jaw and lips, making sure everything still worked before she mouthed off again. Aren't you afraid I'll scream? Counting on it. His offhand remark sent chills along her skin. To regain control of her emotions, she focused on her surroundings, ignoring the manhandling of her body. Hoisted over a man's shoulder, she hung upside down. Strands of hair blocked her view. She craned her neck to see anything that would help. And adding insult to injury... The bastard carrying her stroked her ass like he'd discovered Aladdin's magic lamp. You cut me out of this duct tape and I'll show you my idea of foreplay. The man laughed and gave her one final squeeze from his meaty hand. Not on your life, sweetheart. As far as she could see, shabby red brick buildings extended into the darkness, with only a small section of them illuminated by the headlights of the van and Christian's SUV. One of the delivery bays was open. Voices echoed inside. From the belly of the largest structure, several flashlights cut through the darkness. They cast an eerie glow, elongating the shadows of McBride's men. No electricity told her the buildings had been abandoned long ago. None of this place looked familiar. 
The only signs of life were the vehicles parked in front, and she had a suspicion they'd be pulled into the old building out of sight. When that happened, not a trace of her would be left behind. The decayed warehouse would swallow her whole. Now she would know firsthand what Mickey had experienced. Once inside, the stale smell of mildew stifled her breath. It was difficult enough to breathe upside down. Sparingly, she sampled the air as if it were toxic, but the sound of McBride's voice made her stomach lurch. Fresh meat for the slaughter. He grabbed her hair and gave it a tug, straining the muscles of her neck. But first, I propose a little reunion. Enlisting the aid of one of the hangar crew, Fiona found a phone in the office. Behind a closed door, she gripped the receiver and stared at the buttons. Her chair creaked as she shifted her weight, her nerves getting the better of her. Months had turned into years, and the years spun into decades, and still she'd resisted making contact with Nicholas Charbonneau. Now her pulse raced in anticipation of hearing his voice again, so soon after she'd seen him in Versailles. He had instigated that encounter, a complete surprise. This time she would be reaching out to him, asking for a favor. Her focus drifted in and out as her trembling fingers hovered near the numbers, but she must swallow her pride. Much more was at stake. Slowly she punched in the number she had committed to memory long ago. She'd locked it away in her heart. Nicholas answered on the third ring. Yes? Fiona felt certain he had caller ID and would screen his calls, but the number would only show Dunhill Aviation, and that might pique his interest. For an instant, she weighed the consequences of her actions and considered the risk. Once she spoke, he'd know she was stateside. What other torturous games would he launch against her? Nicky, it's Fiona. Dead silence as cold as the stern glare from his violet eyes. You've come home. A long moment ticked by. Why have you called? No games, no feigned cordiality. His tone scared her. He held the advantage. All she could do was, I need your help, she pleaded. A low rumble of laughter ridiculed her. He wasn't going to make this easy. Fighting back tears, she tightened her lips and choked down a sob. Her Nicky had grown so cold. After all these years, Fiona, you know any help from me comes with a price. Are you willing to pay it? By his tone, she knew he flaunted his superior position, presuming she'd never yield to him. For God's sake, haven't we both paid that price? Her question rhetorical, she didn't wait for his sarcasm. What do you want, Nicky? I'll do whatever you ask. Just stop this vendetta of yours. Silence. Only the sound of his breathing filled the emptiness. She needed him to understand. You've won. But this killing must stop. You don't know what you're doing. She regretted her poor choice of words the instant she'd said it, and desperation seeped into her voice. It couldn't be helped. The face of her son flashed in Fiona's mind. She knew Christian. If Detective Mackenzie was in danger, he'd protect her without regard for his own safety. Damn it! All those years ago, her cowardly actions and poor judgment had come full circle. And it might cost the life of her only child. She'd have gladly taken the retribution upon herself, being the guilty one— but Christian deserved none of it. He'd already suffered too much for her sins. Oh, then enlighten me, my dear, he taunted, still the cagey player. What exactly am I doing? Even now, her instincts stopped her from blurting out the truth. Nicholas would never find out from her that Christian was his son. She'd have to find another way to get him to listen to reason. If death is all that will appease you, then I am offering myself. 
Closing her eyes, she filled her lungs and let her breath out slowly, allowing fear to wash over her. She swallowed hard, then spelled it out for him. Kill me. It's what you really want, isn't it? Tell me where I can meet you. Once again, he fell silent. Startled for a moment, she thought he'd hung up the phone. Fiona tightened her grip on the receiver and listened for any sound at all. As she opened her mouth to speak, he broke the stalemate. It's out of my hands, Fee. We'll both have to live with the aftermath. His words stabbed her heart. No, it couldn't be over. Her mind wouldn't accept such finality. Nicky, please! A dial tone mocked her. He ended the call, bitterness in his voice. It was too late. Nicholas stared blankly into the crackling fire, his eyes mesmerized by the only light in the room. The flames cast eerie shadows along the stone hearth and into the cavernous study. Sitting amidst his fine collection of books and artifacts and rare paintings, he'd come to the realization that none of it meant a thing. Echoing in his mind, Fiona's frightened voice bedeviled his dubious sense of morality. His gaze drifted toward the crystal snifter in his hand, its contents a fine family blend of cognac. Slowly, he swirled the amber liquid along the inside of the glass and watched it coat the rainbow prisms with its ambrosia. If he placed a call to Jasmine now, he might endanger her, placing his bodyguard at risk with the sound of a cell phone that might give her position away. Most probably, her phone would be switched off altogether. Trust. It all came down to trust. His soft chuckle invaded the silence. Trust? Irony was a self-inflicted wound, its own brand of torment. Was he truly trying to convince himself that he trusted Jasmine? Trusted anyone at all? You arrogant fool, he chastised himself. The sound of his voice echoed in the hollow space of his heart. He tossed back the fine cognac. His throat burned with its honey. His grand scheme had lost its luster. Nicholas had seen Nicky Blair as a loose end, one that needed his attention. Fiona would never have taken care of the man on her own. Even now, Nicholas wasn't sure why he had stepped in the middle. Was he protecting her? Or in his arrogance, did he want to be the only one who knew her secret? None of that mattered now. He had set this whole fiasco in motion. Now he would live or die with the aftermath. It looked like a dead end. Bad choice of words. The beam from a flashlight was her only guide through the long, dark corridor. One man carried her, and another walked beside Logan McBride. Three savage men. Raven would soon find out what McBride meant about a reunion. Her stomach twisted into a knot of fear, her mind filling with the horror of rape or some other brand of torture. She steeled herself for any outcome. No matter what they did to her body, she vowed to come out of this alive. She had to believe that. Giving up wasn't in her nature. She closed her eyes for an instant, garnering her strength but her mind grappled with one thought. For her to walk away from this, she would have to take lives. Like her father, most cops went through their whole career never actually faced with that dilemma. No such luck for her. She would have to decide. Would she kill to stay alive? Her answer? A resounding yes! Through the murkiness, her eyes spied a door ahead. With the beam of light focusing on it, she felt certain it would be their destination. But what the hell was behind it? All too soon, she would know. The door creaked open, rusted at its hinges. Before she got a good look, she was thrown roughly to the ground, her spine and shoulders punished by the concrete floor, even through her coat. A beam of light blinded her. Squinting, she turned her head, her only defense— with hands tied behind her back, she couldn't shield her eyes. Catching only glimpses of motion, she counted boots, trying to decipher where her captors stood. 
but a sound coming from the far corner of the dark room jarred her. Shoes scuffed the cement floor. A low moan. Who else was in the room? Damn! Were there more of them? Before she allowed her instincts to cloud with fear, she had to know. Detective, you remember Father Antonio. She peered through the dark and caught a motion on the fringes of the light. The priest cowered in the corner. His hands covered his face. By the looks of him, he'd been beaten. Raven wanted to comfort the man, but McBride wasn't through with him. Father, don't be so uncharitable. If this woman beats the odds, she might just save your pathetic ass. Would that buy her a ticket into heaven? The priest gave no response. But that didn't stop McBride from dishing out more of his abrasive charm. He knelt by her side, amusement in his voice. Got a challenge for you, Mackenzie. Just think of it like a game of Monopoly. If you get past go, you win. I don't like games. She rolled to one side, her eyes searching the dark. The small room had only one door. All women like games, detective. Besides, declining is not an option. Quite frankly, your life depends on it. And to up the ante, Father Antonio's life hangs in the balance, too. What's the objective? she asked, stalling to better assess her options. The priest's hands and feet were unbound. If they were going to play a game, would she be cut loose? Oh, it's very simple. The objective is to stay alive. McBride enjoyed his role as the demented master of ceremonies, and the men in the room laughed. The low rumble ridiculed her predicament and told her what these men thought of her chances. With these odds, even she wouldn't take the bet. You see, there is only one way out of this building. If you get by my men and find your way to freedom, you live. Backlit, his face was in the shadows, but she visualized his pompous grin as he shrugged and gestured his decree. The bastard needed killing bad. But McBride wasn't done spouting his rules for survival. I'm presuming, of course, that you'll take the good father with you, not just leave him to my wolves. But that's your choice. Tell you what. Extra bonus points if you escape with your guardian angel in tow. How's that? And what do I get for taking you out? She narrowed her eyes and searched for his in the murkiness. Oh, I want you to find me, darling. That's end game, the center of the maze. His words raised the hair on her neck. In the end, it's just gonna be you and me. I'm going to be the last thing you hear. His voice echoed through the room like the hiss of a snake. He slid a finger down the length of her cheek, his fingernail nearly breaking the skin. And my hands will take liberties with your body. But you won't care, because you'll be sucking down your own blood, drowning in it. Makes me hard just thinking about it. The SOB had just dropped the temp in the room by twenty degrees. Her body trembled with the chill, her back against the cement. McBride stood, staring down at her. See you on the other side of this door. I'm sure Father Antonio can help remove your restraints. Once you cross the threshold, the game begins. There's no going back. His men headed for the doorway, but McBride turned once more, finding her in the gloom. Don't keep me waiting. McBride, she called out. As he turned, the flashlight cast an eerie glow onto his stern face. Riddle me this, Batman. Why did you kill Mickey Blair? That was your handiwork, wasn't it? The cop in her ignored the danger, wanting only his confession. He laughed, the sound echoing through the room. You are one stubborn bitch, Mackenzie. What the hell? Yes, 
I killed that arrogant S.O.B. Blair. Was rather proud of that job, and as for the reason, let's just call it professional courtesy. She tensed her jaw, not fully understanding his cryptic comeback, but she wouldn't get another crack at him. As the door creaked closed, she and Father Antonio were thrown into darkness. Her eyes fought for any image to define the space. Nothing. The emptiness overwhelmed her. Raven closed her eyes, then opened them again. Still nothing. Her equilibrium thrown off balance, she imagined herself floating weightless and free. Sound was another matter. The shallow breathing of Father Antonio alerted her, but under his breath she heard something else. The muffled sound of the priest's voice came from dead ahead. With the dank air sucking into her lungs, Raven crawled along the gritty floor. Drawing closer, she realized the man was praying. Father, talk to me, she whispered. I'm here. The priest's voice cracked with fear. But I can't d do this. He'd already given up. 